Right, so, so that's running. Right, hello, running. Cassie. Could you just, for the sound level, could you just state your name and your date of birth? Hmm. I'm just Cassie. Cassie Moore. Pellucci is a married name. I was born on the 9th of the 1st, 1933. Lovely. Okay, thank you. And as you know, this project is about superstitions that, that the fishermen had um, to keep them safe or that they would uh, try and avoid certain objects. So could you just tell me what you remember about your family or fishing families and the superstitions they had? I did have them written down and I've left them in the shop. <laughs> this isn't them. Okay. So I'll try to think about them okay. anyway. Well, we had lots of superstitions. My mother did anyway. And I think the first one would be uh, don't whistle in the house. Don't rattle the doors and make all the wind. And um, of course the salt you throw over your shoulder. Um, well, lots. My brothers were all fishermen, skippers, chief engineers, GY in Grimsby and Hull. And they were very superstitious. They said, Tommy, to stop whistling. Shut up. They said, what? Shut up. Oh, right then. And then, of course, they fished out of here before they went big boating and got the tickets. And... Uh, they didn't like it to mention the name R-A-T in the house or P-I-G. Got a smack around the face if you said that. So, uh, R-M-O-N-K-E-Y. I don't know why, but that was she used to say. And, um, of course... I mean, I'm superstitious as well, but I must have got it off me, though. Because uh, when I clean up outside the house and sweep it all and everything and clean the knocker, I put salt all along, keep the devils out, and at the back, keep the devils at the other side of the door. And there's lots and lots. What else? Can you remember any, more? Well, they didn't down. like the nuns to be on the pier, and they didn't like the parsons to be on the pier. They wouldn't go to sea until they'd gone. And um, <laughs> if my brother, he always wore a cap on Harry, my eldest brother, I think we'd have all starved but for him. My mother was a widow at 38, and she brought us all up. How she did it, five boys and me, I'll never know. And, of course, his name was on the rent book. And if he went out without his cap, he would come back and say, I've forgotten anything, Harry, I'm my cap. And he would sit down and he would count to ten before he went out again. He wouldn't, he would be unlucky otherwise. So I think we've all been superstitious. And I've written them all down, I've forgotten half of them. But lots, every day, every day something. You know, if I went to buy a new purse, I wear them out. If I went to buy a new purse, um, I would ask her to put the change in it when she, before she gave me it to keep the devil out. And on New Year's Eve, we all, lots of locals down here, we get a, call it a lucky bag. It's a piece of coal, some green holly off the tree, some bread, and some silver. That would, you've got enough for winter, in other words. Push it up that. <laughs> drain pipe outside to a nice young gentleman because they used to go in Princess Square New Year's Eve singing and things like that and I've lived in this house for 50 years I only came to stay for a week and um, and then as these two, I knew these two boys men used to come along here and I'm sitting in my dressing gown on the steps and the first time I said it would, would you mind <laughs> I thought I don't know what thing I want them for and uh, they come over and I say, would you bring that in place? Because I have nobody coming in tonight and I don't know who's coming in tomorrow and I want you to bring that packet through with you. Well, I told them what I've told you what it was. And so every year they come now. <laughs> I don't go out New Year's Eve because a lot of my family ring me up and from so all that over the world. brings good luck, does That's it That's to make sure we're all right for heating, food, warmth and shelter and a little bit of money. That's what that's for. 
And, uh, well, my mother's done it, and I've always done it. At one time, you had to work for somebody that was very dark haired and very brown eyed. And we haven't got anybody like that in our family. <laughs> so, we'll probably get a stranger off the street. But I don't mind about the colours or anything, but just the first man put his foot over and it'd bring me a bit of luck in. But uh, <laughs> you often wonder why, but some of them make sense, you know. I mean, if a bird came in my house that didn't belong here, I'm not talking about a caged bird or a canary or whatever. My granny always had a canary. A strange bird, not necessarily a seagull either, a, a, a dove, anything, a bird that came in the house, my mother would be very upset. Oh dear, bad luck. And if it came down the chimney, she would say, somebody's going to die today. And it did used to happen. You know, I think, oh... She's a very wise man, well, very clever, very intelligent. She had a good upbringing. We're all born on a Westgate. And um, even, you know, if a picture was on the wall and it was a bit skew with, she'd said, leave it. Well, no, don't touch it. Somebody that doesn't live here can put it right. Oh, if a picture fell off the wall, oh dear, that was bad luck. So there's all sorts of things like this. Lots I can't remember, but every day I sometimes think, you know, a whistling woman and a crowing hen brings the devil out of his den. You always remember silly things that happen to me now in my life. I think, oh, that's weird. And little things come back to you. You don't learn them to, to remember them. They're just with you all the time. My mother's very superstitious. She's a good, kind woman. She was 87 when she died. She fell and broke her hip. Uh, but you see, she was only young when my dad died. He's only 40, he'd been in the First World War. Uh, it's there somewhere. And um, it was hard to bring us up. And of course, a woman, she couldn't have a house if she didn't have a man. And she couldn't get a decent job. So she worked in the laundry, in Rothbury Hall Laundry. She used to meet me from school, I was going there to keep warm. And, um, you know, I mean, if she hadn't have had a name on her rent book, they wouldn't have let us have a house. So what would have happened to us then? Were you ever, it's cruel. Were it's you cruel. ever allowed on the boats? Because there was a superstition Me? about no. women on the boats. Me, yes, because I was little and I didn't know if I was a boy or a girl anyway. Because I, 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 I had jeans before people invented them. My mother used to plait my hair right long, push it up there like that, and then put this little pom-pom mat on. I never had any shoes on. Well, I had shoes, but they were for school. And I went all over by myself. And then, perhaps, coming home, I would say, go tell your brothers the dinner's ready or whatever. So I would run across the boats. Because then, it was full. The harbour was full, especially this time of year. Well, September, October time. But it was full anyway. And I made a good living. But uh, everybody knew me. Get home, your mother's looking for you. You know, I never fell in or anything, you know. Oh, they'd be there and they'd say, come on, we're off a poem, we'll take you with us. Or, nobody hit me, nobody molested me. No, no, I had a good upbringing. We weren't poor. We weren't far from being poor. We just didn't have any money. Did they ever take you to sea, though, on the oh, boats? Oh, no, but not till I got older. Oh. And it wasn't a fishing boat. My brother that's the sea captain, Bill, he, um, there'd be something... That, I don't know what it was, but this man in Hull had asked him, it, would he uh, take his timber boat, to it was empty when we went, to collect some timber from Norway, Sweden, he, we went all over. And he said, would you like to come, Cass? I said, oh, I don't know, oh, I'm not, I, I get seasick. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, get Jackie Mann, if anybody's watching this, everybody knows him. Get Jackie Man to bring you out the rowing boat and bring little Cassie with you and I'll take you. I said, okay. So maybe in fishing they were superstitious. Because sea captains took their wives with them sometimes, you know, and all the family. I've seen boats come in here with, with nappies on the line, you know. So we did it. We went through the Keel Canal and then got bought some timber there. Met my daughter and me just went walking about. And then uh, went to Sweden, went to Norway and he'd sell it and fill it and sell it and fill it and then... Jackie Mant had taken me out in the rowing boat and picked me up outside Scarborough because it was better for him. He was coming from uh, Portsmouth, I think. Anyway, 
Yes, I have been on boats. Because obviously it was quite a dangerous life, oh, wasn't it? Like out at sea, oh, you can see why they'd want oh, to leave that women that radio at home. over there, you can see it, Mark. That used to be Mother's radio. She was the only one on the street that had a radio. And she had it because, I mean, other people went to sea, but nobody around us that would see. We were in, a, in this community, but they kind of went where the dads went, you know, in, in factories and things. But she had it on and I can hear us and, oh dear, I see it's bad weather. Shh, shh, she was like, she can't hear it. And then you had to have accumulators for them. Do you know what they are? The battery. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Gosh, they're heavy, you know. And uh, so you had to have accumulators and they were heavy. Johnny Jackson, he was a mayor, he had a, a, a big, big shop opposite Boys' front entrance. And they sold the kids boots, the poor kids, just to get... Uh, vouchers for boats and things and he also did accumulators and there was a big counter up there like that so I took these up oh come on Cassie said, come on and as I walked in he'd have another two on the counter so he would take them down then he'd take me over the road with them and I got a penny each for them and then when everybody got the radios well I did everybody as you say so and I gave all the money to my mother we all gave the money to my mother and if ever we wanted anything she said there's some money in there Cassie if there's anything you want yeah. And I was all, always well dressed, especially when my brothers grew up. You know, the big white fivers. <laughs> Had a few of them. I said, what, What's the matter? I said, what, what did you say? Oh, go away, Cassie, we're talking. Go away. Give her some money, send her uptown, get, her some, get something, buy yourself something. So I don't know much about fishing. I just can only tell you what I know from being. You, I think you mentioned once before about teaspoons. Oh, yes. It's very superstitious that, you know. You and me having a cup of tea and I'm stirring my tea up and then you come and you're... you know, oh, two spoons. I don't know if it's a sign of a wedding or a sign of a christening, something like that. I know when my son was born, my eldest son, we were getting him christened. They were all christened at St Mary's Church. I was married there. And... Um, Granny Metcalf, my little granny, quite a clan of them, my mother's mother. She said, have you been churched, lady? I said, well, what do you mean? <laughs> she said, well, have you been to church? I said, well, no. She said, well, you must go to church. I said, well, I brought your great grandson to see you. No, can't come in. I said, all right then. So I went on to my mother. I said, what, what did she mean? She said, oh, Cassie, I thought you'd been churched. I said, well, I did go to talk to a vicar about it, which I did do. Because I, well, I don't know why I did it. I've just had a good upbringing. We're not barrel punches, but we all went to Sunday school. And um, he did bless me. But the baby can't go in anybody's house till it's been christened. So that's another superstitious, and it goes on now. Because they thought the devil was in the baby. Yeah, they right. wouldn't let you in the house. They won't, well, ask Lindy or anybody down here, they won't let you in. So, uh, my eldest son was born with a veil on. That, that's. Uh, what they happened? say you never drowned. Well, he was born at home. All my children were made and born on the same bed, right? And I wouldn't go in hospital. And the midwife burnt it. Burnt it? Because she put it on her side, you see. Mother had come in and she put it on the... Oh, God, don't touch that. It's very precious. And that was it, that was it. Went there. Then Mother said, where's the uh, veil? And I said, uh, well, I don't know. So she asked the midwife, because they burn everything. All the afterbirth and everything after had a baby. And even if I'd been in hospital, they'd chuck it away. They wouldn't have known where it was. Only a fishing family would have known where it was. And so I haven't got it. But I was reading a book. I'm always reading books. And it said that uh, there was a veil for sale uh, down in, um, somewhere down south, Dover, I think, that I'd want to sell. And they were asking a thousand pounds for it. They say you'll never drown if you bought what was with a barney weather. Was the baby lucky? Did he grow up to be fairly lucky? Or? Oh, that's our John. You've met him. Mm. He's got his own business and everything. He's got his skipper's ticket. And I thought, well... Well, Jess went, the younger boy, he went to sea school. Great, very clever lad. Graham Sea Training School, like my brothers did and everything. And um, three of my cousins went to that school and got torpedoed through, yeah. And um, Scarborough lads. 
we went to the same class and everything and they're on a shield somewhere. I gave it to the old uh, Graham Street training boys. I don't know. Jim might know. And uh, John went in the army. Quite good he was. He was uh, Major Pure's bodyguard and all that. Anyway. So you think it did bring him luck in his life? Oh, I do. Definitely. Definitely. No doubt about that. Uh, oh, every time I think, God. Or I think he'll be all right. I've always known he will be. And Jess, who went to sea school, and my brother took him to Russia with him, our Bill, uh, on his trawler out of Hull. He took him to uh, Bear Island and all that. What an experience. He was only 11. And um, it was all in the paper, isn't it? Anyway, he went to sea school and he didn't go to sea. John didn't go to sea school, and he went in the army, and he ended up going to sea here. And my brother said, go get your tickets. Not swelling about like that all the time. And he went and got his tickets, passed for his skipper's ticket and everything, and then my brother came home from South Africa. with all John in his Porsche and all that driving about. And um, he said, come back with me, John. No, you've got your tickets. I'll see you're all right. He's very strict, my brother, you know. A lot of things. He's easy going, and he was easy going, but he meant it and so John said well I'll give it a try Uncle Bill he says alright and he's never looked back he was in South Africa you see there they catch langoustines big not lobsters big prawns there'd be a big freezer a great big lorry on the docks waiting for my brother coming in with langoustines for France was flying straight over he made a fortune and then I'll jump Met this girl. I've been to South Africa and Durban a lot. And he met this girl, uh, Ronnie Petronella, and then it's a call her Ronnie or Nelly. Anyway, he married her, and she didn't want him to go to sea, so he went back to college for engineering, and he ended up as an engineer, like Jess wanted to be. And so it goes on. He's got his own business now. He's in China today, actually, because he's taken his uh, manager with him. There's some big uh, deals to be made, and. Is he still superstitious? Does yes, he, yes. What sort of he's got an earring he in still, and he doesn't got. He's still got his earring, in, little gold thing. And he, does that bring luck as yes, well? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Oh yeah. What it's, sort of things would bring you luck then? What well, kind of charms know, or I, things? Yeah, I've got, I've got, I've got that there. Sure a broomstick. Is, yeah. Oh yes, I've got is it that lucky? A broomstick. Is oh lucky. yeah, it keeps the devil out. Does it matter which way up the broomstick? It's got is? to be that way, near a window. I've got one at the back as well. So it's got to be with the, yes, uh, the, up, up. the brush bit up. up. Yeah. So it's unlucky if it's down. Yeah, yeah oh. it's got to be up. If it was down, it would break it anyway. Oh. It would gradually. I've had it years and years, yeah. There's all, there's all sorts of little things in here as well. Yeah, I'm very superstitious. I'm just wondering how, how, how is it unlucky if it's up well, the it's, way? I don't, to, well, do you know? they say if it's down, it means... It, 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 you know, let's say, for want of a better word, uh, if if somebody um, really was was superstition, wouldn't go out in the house with, them. and she had a broomstick, and she was talking to you, and neighbours were watching, she would stand her broomstick with the broom broom down. It would mean uh, go away. Oh. She didn't like whoever it was. But it wasn't very nice. But if you have a broomstick, you keep it up like that. So that's welcoming. Yes. Yeah. In. Okay. I have a I have a besom that I sweep with as well, but not that one or the one that's in the other one. I've got two in the window. Because is it a horseshoe is up with the yes, open ends to catch up it. Yeah. To catch the yeah. luck, is yeah. it? Yeah. I've got some of them as well. So <laughs> it's funny when you try to remember, you can't remember when you've gone. I'll say, oh, I knew something to tell him. <laughs> Poor old Maybe you can remind me, Mark. Yeah, um, crossed knives and forks. Oh dear, that's bad luck. I've got some swords here, but they're not crossed. The real, the real swords. From... So once again, what does the cross well, mean? Well, it means it means it's sharp words, and if you don't stop it, yeah, makes sense. That doesn't it? Yeah. Sharp words, yeah. sharp swords, trouble. Pistols at dawn, whatever. Oh dear. Was there any traditions uh, when your brothers went to sea uh, about the, the women? They'd would... never let you pack their bag. They'd never let you pack your bag. 
My brothers all had kit bags. They had posh suite, the sisters as well. But I was no, 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 don't touch that. Put it on the floor, I'll do it myself. Yeah. My brother, <laughs> my other brother, Walt, oh, chief engineer. He, uh, he was very particular about that. Don't no, don't touch that. And he'd gone to see him. We'd laid it all out for him. He'd gone to see him. When he came home, he said, "Who was it? These?" And it was a. Uh, you might not know what I'm talking about, but women will. Um, it's like elastic, not a corset, elastic that you put around there and you had little stockings and things. And he took it with him for armbands so that the sea didn't catch it. You see, he had glasses on our wall. He always wore glasses because he couldn't go on deck because it broke his glasses, hmm. the cold. So he went below and he did all the, he passed the chief engineer out in Grimsby. And uh, it, they'd done nothing but laugh at him when he unpacked his bag on the boat. Said, hey, look, what's this then? <laughs> oh, they had a name for it. I don't know. Suspenders? No, no. Garter? No. Oh, gosh. A roll-on, that's what it was called. A roll-on with, with little suspenders down there. <laughs> Did, was there other things that the women didn't do, like washing the men's clothes if they were no, away? No, they always or... washed them. My mother always made sure that she washed them and she knew they were dry and clean. Even on the day they went to sea? Yeah. Right. And, and, and I don't know, she didn't. We didn't have a washer. We didn't have hot and cold water. I used to get bathed in the bath, the tin bath. I said, Cassie goes first because she's the girl. <laughs> All right. So my mother had a copper house in the back. My mother was very particular, and she would lay it all out, shirts and socks, whatever, and then they would pack it. But when they came home, they said, that's Cassie's, that's yours, Mum, that's that. if they'd been abroad. I mean, I got a food pass from everywhere in the world when the war was on, because they'd be glad to get off the ship in the war, Merchant Navy, and, uh, and they'd go and sleep in the... Uh, Missions to seamen, and they also had to sign the name. And they say, Have you got any family at home? They say, I've got a sister. And so my name would go there, and they'd dress. And so I got from Canada, Bahamas, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, Carl Scarborough. And so everybody at school got some. Was there anything superstitious about the colours, colours of the boats or the numbers on the boats? Or, well, you know. it's funny you should say that. I was thinking about that the other day. There's a lot of boats with green on, isn't there? No, my mother, oh no, not green. No, my brothers wouldn't have green. She wouldn't wear anything green. She might have a little nice handkerchief or something. Or, and of course, the grass is green. She's, but no, no, not green. The south they... says green, get that green out. You'll never have a look, lass. What? Do you know why it was unlucky? No, or? no. Is it something to do with... Oh, only as I've grown up. The only reason I think a man with it... She went to church, she was a good living woman, and we're all married and christened and all that there. But I can only think it's something to do with religion because of these days now. My mother had a bit of Irish in her anyway. She used to sing Irish songs, she'd sing me to sleep. And so that could be the Catholics and the Protestant but, uh, wearing of the green. I was in Scotland once and Johnny Cash and uh, he started to sing that, Forty Shades of Green. And all the, they all started hey, booing him. And he looked and, and he didn't know what it was all about. And he said, I'm very sorry, I didn't know. So it must mean that, but not to my mother. It didn't matter if he was sky blue, pink, the yellow dots on. It didn't make any difference to my mother. But she was very superstitious about green. About what about days of the week or numbers? Oh well, Friday flits short sits. If you flit on a Friday, you won't be in there very long. Mm. Flit on a Friday? Mm. F no, Friday flit short sit. Yeah, no, I didn't. I came in on a Monday. I didn't have anything to carry either. I just came in with two little boys. I just left my husband and. I took him back, but that's not the point. Somebody gave me a mattress, somebody gave me some knives and... F I had a beautiful house I left. And I just said, no, I'm not going back. Well, she have to go back. I said, no. Did, 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 would your brothers go to sea on a Friday or a Sunday? I don't think they would when they were down here. Hmm. I've heard that. I don't think they would when they were down here. <clears throat> and the fishing, uh, the Scotch fishermen wouldn't go to sea on Sundays. No, no. But when they went big boating, what we called big boating, on the big freezer ships and trawler out of Hull and Grimsby, 
Well, it didn't matter when they went because they had to catch the tide. They couldn't just come back home, if you know what I mean. But no, I think they did when they were here. Proper, maybe a Scarborough thing, that. Mm. But uh, no. And did they ever sort of make any offerings into the sea, like coins or a bit of whiskey or anything to, to give them good luck? I've heard that. I've heard that. I haven't seen it, of course, because I haven't been mm. on the fishing boats mm. apart from going down there, getting a fry. Mm. You know, I just walked down and said, take your mother a fry, fish up. You can't go on that pier now. No, but I do remember my mother saying when I had some work done at the back of this house a long time ago, and she gave me a new pound. And she said, have you got any silver? Open your purse. And I just took some silver out, another pound. Something, and she brought me some foreign silver coins, and she said, "Put them in the wall." So they're still in that wall, right down at the back where we were. That new wall. She pushed it into cement like that. I went, men had gone. And smoothed it over. Bring like me that. good luck. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've never looked back actually. <laughs> I haven't had any bad, bad, bad luck. You know, I've been. I've, I don't know. I've got through it, but I've got through it, and that's it. Mm -hmm. The um, we heard that you know some when sometimes the fishermen were being very unlucky, they thought that maybe you know a witch had cast a spell on the boat, so they would have something, mm. some ritual they would have to do yeah. to get the witch. That's out. when they Was would it? do it with the whiskey. That's when they would do that. That it, it's a case. It's, it might not be whiskey if they haven't got any. It was something to clean it, mm. to clear it. You know. Not domestics, you know what I mean? No, they were a bit funny like that, but there's some women, and I can't tell you the name of one of them because I, I wouldn't like to because there's a relation. But if she was down there walking down Pump Hill, round the corner, because there used to be a post office round there and everybody went for the pension. And that, Well, I don't know if they got pension. Anyway, they were always there. And uh, if she was walking around there, they wouldn't go to sea. No. And she wasn't cross-eyed or anything like that. They just said, oh, dear God, it's a waste of time going. And they wouldn't go. And that was, I know, that was only little, but I remember that. Was that, did they call her a Jonah then? Was yes. She, uh, uh, yeah. No, I'll never have no luck. They didn't give her a special name, but everybody knew who it was. Going back. Did they think she was a witch, maybe? No, she wasn't. She was just a bad person. A wicked person, really. Not bad, bad. Mm. It's a children, things like that. Mm. I know that because I experienced it myself. So, but I didn't know that, that she did it. I didn't know she was that bad. Mm. They were very superstitious, though, fishermen, when I think. But my mother used to say, Go to post office, Cassie. Don't go down that way. Go on Princess Street, because I didn't live here then. Go on Princess Street down to Tilgan. It was just at the back of that. Because so they're all there, Callan, talking. Nothing else to do. They're out of a ship. They're all talking. I said, well, they won't talk about me. She said, no, well, they won't because you're not going that way. Go that way, see? But you could, you knew when they're out of a ship because they did all... Where that pirate thing is now? Martin, you know, Martin. Where he is now, shouting, they'd all stand round there. <laughs> I'll sit on farms. And that was all right as well. I never saw my brothers do it, though. They just came home. I had a good upbringing, but there were a lot, a lot of things that you think, oh, don't do that. You know, don't whistle, don't do that. So, and I can't really remember them all, Mark, but a lot, mm. every day something comes to me, I think it's weird that how you remember things and you don't mean to remember them. It's like that I So wrote. people, what did, did the people really genuinely believed in, in a devil and oh, that yeah. there was a really bad oh, spirit? Yeah. yeah, oh yeah. Out there. Yeah. You know, this is my brother, Bill. One of my brothers, he had a, I don't know the name of it, I have the name of it, but it was a big trawler out of all. Uh, somebody on here know what it is. Anyway, he was skipper of it and his wife, she died, his wife, how ran, but that's not the point. He had to come home. And uh, so he came off the ship. And uh, he said to this, when he went back, do you ever get any funny feelings on this boat? He told me this himself, because he said to me, have you got a ghost, Cassie? I said, well, I don't know. He said, yes, you have. I said, oh, right. He said, when that ghost goes, you go. Leave when that goes. It likes you. So, on this boat, this big boat, it went, went down to the bottom eventually. Um, he always had a cocoa at night when he was up at Pinnacle. Knock, knock on the door. 
and uh, they call them a boy, but they're not. They're a man. Uh, the, the, not servants. What do they call them? Galley boy. Uh, yeah, come in. Then he come in. Says, "What are you having, Skip?" He said, "I'll just have some cocoa." Okay, Skip, I'll bring it up. And uh, anyway, he was busy doing his charts or whatever it was. And Jackie Man told me this. And uh, well, it was Ewan Albert was telling. Because people laugh at you, you don't say anything because they laugh at you. And he said, oh yeah, there was a ghost on there, all right. He said, because Gally Boy, I thought it was him coming back. He said, the door opened and he didn't come in. He said, so I said, went down to look for him. And he said, now shut the door. And if he said he shut the door, he shut the door. He said, and it was open again when I come back. He said, I'm not going back on that boat. And he never. And it went down to the bottom. Out of hole, that was. Name will come to me soon. He was very superstitious, I Bill. You wouldn't think so to look at him. He didn't look like a fisherman. He had all his suits and clothes made. And my eldest brother had his shoes made for him, you know, Dulce. Uh, but he was very clever, but he was very superstitious. You know, if anybody, if they said, no, don't go there, or don't do that. And I don't know what it was for when I think back, but he was very super. Well, they all were. I don't know why, but we had some things that happened though. Very dangerous job, isn't it? The poor mother, I don't know, she, she said, oh, your brothers, I'm so worried about them. Because I slept in my mother's bed, because we only had two up and two down. And um, she said, did you wear the wind, Cassie? No. You haven't been whistling, have you? I <laughs> said, no. <laughs> don't whistle now, Sonny. She said, I know you don't mean it, and I don't whistle anyway, but I, I used to do it when I was a little kid. What yeah. happened if you ever mentioned the PAG or the... Oh, you didn't. I mean, if you did, dear me, everything would go quiet, like going to a pub. I don't say in a pub either with fishermen. If you went in a pub and said that, it'd just all go like that, quiet, and they look like that. Do you know why those animals are... No, I do Why? I don't know why. I don't know why. Were there any animals that were considered to be lucky then? The opposite. Well, I don't know, but people said they didn't like cats, but they did, and ships, all ships have cats, don't they? If there was a cat on board, it wouldn't bother them. And, my mother. and then everybody had a cat round here, because there was long tails about, you know, another word for R.A.T. See, I don't say it, I don't, don't even think it. <laughs> I don't have to think about it. And there was, it, it's rife, you know, I used to take, I had an Afghan hound, our cable, and I was taking up the dikes. And all of a sudden, like that, and it was a big RAT off the dike. You wouldn't believe how many there was, and I didn't know they were there. But uh, so it was running wick, the harbour, the fish, all these alleys. So everybody had a cat, and if you had a cat on the boat, well, that's all right as well. Because they have long tails on, on boats, and if the ship's going to sink, that's when they all leave, and then you know it's going to the bottom. Dear, dear. Yeah, nice childhood. Right. There was a war run when I was little, you know. Well, the bomb dropped not far from here, Potter Lane. My aunt had a house there. Aunt Nan uh, Crawford, her name was Metcalf for that. My mother's sister. And she was the first on there that bought, it, bought a house. Her husband was a skipper. Not a big skipper, a skipper out there. Had his own boat. They all, they all had their own boat, my aunt's. And um, the bomb dropped there, so she got first choice of a house to be built when it got built. But saying that, my mother had to go, to, every woman who had children, it doesn't matter, you had to go, I think it was Plaxton's, where uh, they made bullet boxes to put bullets in us, I don't know, something like that. And um, so one week we'd all be at Auntie Martha's house, who wasn't the real auntie, but she had all her kids as well. Auntie Beatty, Beatty Belshaw, Auntie, Auntie Martha Leader, and my mother, Mrs. Aunt Moon, and they're all our aunties, but they, they weren't real aunties. So we'd all sleep there one night, and all sleep there another night. And the night the bomb dropped, we're all in number two Key Street, Auntie Martha's, big family of them now. And um, all the roof fell in on us. And, uh, you know, and I, well, I don't know what it was. But, you know, sometimes I was 12 in a bed, Mark. 
with those top. Nobody touched me. I swear to God, nobody touched me. Nobody molested me. Nobody hit me. Not, and we cuddled because we were frightened and we were cold. We, we all stayed together, whichever house we were living in. And we were well clean, we were well looked after. And what she didn't have, you can't have. We all have the same, we all share it. The cattle singing and things like that. And so they took us to a church. There's two churches, one at Bass, uh, the end of Bass Street. No, Bar Church they call it, the end of Aberdeen Wall. Further on, where the work, what they call it, job centre. There was another one called Jubilee Church. And then I ended up in there because I was the only girl, little. And I'm crying, I want my mummy, mummy, mummy. Where's my brother, brothers, and all that. And I'd be six. And I've got these big steps, and I mean, there's little, everybody, all these little beds. Because they came from Seymour and Aiton all over to go to these big churches to be safe. Well, I don't know if they believe that, or whether it's because of a big, strong building. Anyway, and I'm crying, 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 and I saw these soldiers coming in, set these big tables up, big white sheets or cloths, and plates. And I'm crying, and this bloke, this sort of stop crying, blondie. What's who here? I said, I want me, mummy. He says, You really can't love her. You'll see her tomorrow. And then I put me under the covers. And then I'm still crying under the covers. A very rare cry. And I was terrified. And um, he come back. He says, Will you shut up? What do you keep crying for? I said, Well, I can't. I don't like these tickly blankets. I've never had a blanket. I don't like these tickly blankets. So he went over to the table and just went whoosh, like that and he took the tablecloth off and he said, here, get wrapped up in this. Wow. And he wrapped me up and went to sleep. And then, of course, my mother did come for me the next day, but the police took us all up there. Then I saw uh, Dorothy, then I saw Kenny, then I saw Sylvia. I, th I thought, oh, I'm all right now, because these were all my friends. But your house was destroyed, was it? No, it wasn't destroyed. Number two, Key Street, down there. They say it's the oldest house in Scarborough. That's debatable, but that doesn't matter. We all used to go down in the cellar, and Uncle Tom, he had, uh, he put like bunk beds up, they're called bunk beds now, and there was a, a well under there. I mean, it isn't now, because they just filled it in, because I don't know what else to do. Stupid people. Anyway, so we had to come out because it wasn't safe. So we went to Auntie Beatty's and to my mother's, and then eventually the police and the wardens came and sorted that so it was dry, and then went back in our old routine again. So what, were, was anybody killed in no, the bomb? Well, no, nobody belonging to me, but there was a uh, Potter Lane. Uh, there was one uh, a little shop there. I'm not old enough to remember exactly, but I remember my mother saying, uh, oh, I saw it. I went up one day after it had got, after it was all over. Sylvia took me in a quick big hall. And, you know, and there's a, you can see a toilet up there halfway through, you know, and, and curtains and... Uh, Things hanging out of windows and, and pots all over and ornaments smashed and great, great big hall as big as this house in uh, I don't know, Castle Gardens they call it now, we call it Potter Lane. So I remember all that but I don't, I don't, I don't re really remember a lot more, I'd only be about well, 1939 that would be, I'd be six. I was born in 1933. But we all were together, we were always together. The, the town was full of soldiers and marching, and it was all marked out on the foreshore down there. You know, there's Poles, there's Americans, Canadians, Scotties with the kilts. I used to love to watch them march in the kilts. And I used to wander all over, but they didn't think I was a girl. And nobody ever said a wrong word to me. Nobody said, what are you doing? Nobody said, I think I said, go and home, your mum wants you. You know, I said, Germans will get you. I said, oh, Germans will get you. Because I used to wander off my mother, she knew I was all right. And I said, well, well who's these Germans then? I said, oh, you don't want to know about that. I mean, all them stories are frightened me to death. And uh, I've met a lot of German people, they're just like us, you know. So helicopter, it's crazy, it does it about this time of night. Turn around and somebody's taking pictures, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. So, uh, Princess, I used to pass this house when I was a little girl because there was a dairy on there. And, uh, milk, yeah. And uh, this front door was always open as I passed this house. Uh, there was a chemist there, there was a butcher's there, 
the, the, everything. We didn't need to go up the town. I think we went to the market and that's as far as we went. My mother called that city square. So um, it's sort of changed. Oh, what a fruit shop we had. So I used to pass this house and I think, oh, I like that house. And as you look, as I passed, I'd look through on my way back and then I'd come back off there and I'd look again. There's a big uh, laburnum tree there. I'd to have it taken out when the kids were because of poison. And I think, oh, I like that. And I, know, I only came here because I had nowhere else to go. You've got your silver ball hanging up there. Yeah. What's, what's the silver oh, it's ball? It's a witch's ball. It's just lucky. And I have, I have another one that my granny gave me, Granny Metcalf. And what does it, how does it work then? Well, it doesn't. You just don't do anything. It's just lucky. If you get a headache, it's just looking it. <laughs> it needs a good dust. Witches have them, or fortune tellers. They pretend to see things I don't know. But if you had to sit quiet and really think, you do think things, don't you? I like it, and <clears throat> I think my Granny Metcalf must have been a little bit like that. She was gifted, and uh, she was very educated as well. And she uh, used to get, uh, I wish she'd written it all down, you know. She used to go on dikes for herbs and mix them up and things. She used, my mother used to say, go see Granny, Saturday penny I used to get. And she used to make her own ginger, she didn't drink or smoke. She used to make her own ginger wine and cough candy. And uh, I've always suffered from a sore throat, even now I do it. And um, she said, open your mouth, Cassie, open your mouth. Wider, let me have a look. Yeah. Have a look. And she used to, it was like a cone, paper, like that. And then she used to uh, put some in it. I don't, I'll tell you what it was, I think. And she put it in it like that. And then she'd say, open your mouth, I'm going to put this in your throat, okay. And then she'd take the end off like that, and she'd put that in my mouth and blow down it and then she'd give me some cough candy and then a drink of ginger beer it wasn't real beer and uh, it was sulfur for my sore throat it didn't hurt and it didn't taste bad because she got that candy oh here, here eat this <laughs> did it work? yeah got a sandy penny off her I oh, know she was a lovely lady but there's a lot of Metcalfs about a big clan of them People use a lot of herbs and, and their oh. own remedies and things then in those Very days. Very clever, Grandma. People used to go to, they'd call her a witch, I suppose, today. Yeah, that's her. She, uh, they'd always go to Granny Metcalf, Mrs Metcalf, that so-and-so's poorly, do you think you could come on? And she would, and she'd, she'd perhaps rub them down or wrap them up, or she always said... She'll catch a chill, not because she's cold, or she'll only catch a chill bad when she's wet and sits in it a lot. That's what she used to say, mm. which is true to this day. She knew everything, all them herbs, she knew all about them. And she used to grow a lot of things in her back garden. She lived up to Tolligate then. But uh, first fish and chip shop in Scarborough, any old locals will know this, uh, was at top of Dumple. You asked me where Dumple was, Frygate, that on Long Westgate. And these three girls, there were three girls there, used to live in the li little houses. Three. Number 33, my mother was born. 33, 35 and 37. But 33 was the first fish and chip shop in Scarborough. Not like now, with fish and chips and paper, but all my mother's brothers and that were fishermen bringing fish up and somebody, one of them had a smoke house and, and great aunt Ginny who brought my mother up, she was clever and so, and they always said, Elsie told me, she said, they always knew if they went up to Mrs Woods, that was my mother's auntie, and there was any fish and chips left, she'd always give them them, cold, what was left from the night before. She grew up eating a lot of fish. Oh, fish for dinner, fish for breakfast, fish for tea. Fish for supper. I said I'm never eating fish again. I've been to see my brother though, come to think about that, out of here. Or oh, Harry took me. Yeah, I'd forgot about that. Eldest brother. His uh, fisherman put a farm for him on um, near the lighthouse pier, just as Harry Moon fisherman. 
he was a good fisherman. But he had to stay at home because he was the eldest, he had to look after us all. But um, he used to take me with him in my school holidays because nobody else would look after me. He said, she keeps wandering off. So, uh, and he'd cut us, I'm hungry, all right. Oh, Cassie, shut up. Oh, I'm hungry. I know you are. We'll be in in a minute, potting, you know. So he took it, oh, my lobsters and all sorts. And he was had a big copper out in, it was, if it was as big as that, our yard, that's all it was. And she'd, he'd boil them in the copper. And my mother had, she'd take the cloths off the table, big scrub table. And he'd come in with these lobsters and that and crack them all. Here, eat that. Oh, I don't want that. I thought you was hungry, Cassie. I said, well, I am, but I don't want that. Well, what do you want? I said, I want some bread and jam. We haven't got any bread and jam, Cassie. You either eat that or you'll get nothing. Do you think life is better for people now than oh, it was then? Oh, yes. Or not? We yeah. don't want them good old, bad old days back, Martin. No way. I mean, I know these kids put on it a lot. But rather that than people go hungry. You know, it's a shame. I mean, they'd lock people up for nothing. Just for not having a job. Or not, or not being a tramp or, or whatever. And th what else? They didn't know what else to do. I watched a thing on telly, uh, Ems, that artist. Um, Ems, um, she did a bed. You understand what I mean? Tracy Ems. Yes. And it was, who do you think you are? And she comes from gypsies and that. And they didn't have anything. You know, when one of them got jailed because he pinched them to get some for some food. I mean, like our heritage centre, I only I'm learning more down there than ever. The first uh, convict ship was built in Scarborough. I mean, most of them convicts had only pinched a loaf of bread. Not with a bad social history, you know. It's terrible. I mean, I, I, I'm not on the sides of the criminals, but I like to think there's something behind it. You know why? But now, my children wandered all over. They were all over the place, my kids. On the big rope swing on the dikes, John broke his arm and, you know, fly through the air with the greatest of his ropes. And they all, come on, come on. The kids are always in, everybody's kids come here. And uh, and you could let them, but I have all them great grandchildren, I love them dearly. But I won't let them out on their own. I mean, I help out down the lifeboat shop, which I have done for 11 years, and they come down there with me, but I, I can see them where they are. They're on the sands, they're all right. But everybody knew everybody when I was young. Your mum's not in, come in here for a bit. So the community is gone, is oh, it? Oh, like? yeah. I don't know my neighbours, really. People say hello to me, and of course I say hello back. But I don't know who they are. But uh, it's sad in a way, because, I mean, I, I love my family and they love me. But that's not the point. I was ill once. I'm very independent. I'm very independent. And uh, nobody rang me for a full week. Nobody called to see me. I was feeling sorry for myself. And I thought, well, this is damned terrible, this. Nobody even cares about me anymore. And I had a few tears. Because I was run down and I was tired and I'd had a bit of bother, you know. And it kind of took me over a little bit. But uh, then it wasn't that. It's because I'm so independent that they don't intrude. But I don't do anything anyway. <laughs> if I didn't go to the lifeboat house, and if I didn't come to the maritime centre, I'd probably just sit and read all day and get fat like everybody else. <laughs> That'll be the day. So this house is so big and I've such a lot to do. There's the kids' toys there. I've got to sort them. I've got two pictures there. I've had them two years and pictures over there, and I'm, I'm still. I get them put up, but I like. I love this old house. Lovely. All right. Thank you very much. Oh dear. You get. Like I say, so can I the... just ask you to say no, no. your name and your date of birth, please? Oh, yes. Christiana Sheeda. And your birth? Uh, 9th of December, 1927. Okay. Can you tell... Uh, and what we're talking to you today, Chris, about is 
Can I call you Chris? Of course you can. Yeah. Um, what we're talking to you today about really is superstitions yeah. and beliefs, um, or lucky charms, things like that. We're doing this for the Scarborough Maritime Heritage and for the Museum Trust. So if I could mm. just ask you to tell us a little bit about your thoughts on superstitions. Well, it, like I say, it was uh, very strange to me because we'd just got married and we went practically to Grimsby about a fortnight later. Mm. And um, when we got there, and I made friends straight away with, with the ship that Jim was in then, uh, with the crew. And in fact, I'm still friendly with the, the couple. We're still friendly with the couple. And... Uh, we keep in touch, mm -hmm. we ring each other up and that sort of thing. So we've been really, you know, good friends. So did, did um, you have any superstitions when Jim went to sea? Or well, was there any superstitions you had yourself, well, not just no, to do with the sea? Just the one that I learnt, uh, um, not to wash the day Jim went away. And, uh, you know, leave it till the next day. And... Uh, because they always said you're washing them away and so I just thought well I didn't think anything of it to be honest and um, you were glad on that day to really uh, go out because everything just went flat at home and um, that's the only thing I ever went along with but I, st I still didn't think anything of it because I'm not a, a, a superstitious person. So you, you no. would walk under a ladder? Uh, yeah, yes. I wouldn't bother. But would you throw salt over your shoulder and things like that? Well when I've spilt salt, yeah. oh yes, I have thrown a bit over my shoulder if I've spilt it. Superstition. Spilling <laughs> salt. But um, anything else I can't, I just couldn't imagine. Mm. What about good luck charms? About? Good luck charms. Did you ever carry anything no. for luck? No, I didn't have a, a good luck charm at all. Um, the only thing that um, I have um, some beads that belong to my mother and I wear those regularly and um, my crucifix really. Uh, that's uh, all. I think of it, it's because it, that was me, it belonged to my mum, the beads, but the crucifix, uh, it means a lot to me. In what way? Well, because we're Christians, and I like to think I'm a devout Christian. So, uh, and I, I, I really can't, I know uh, it was uh, Jim used to say, and, well, Oh, my dad, he used to think monkeys were unlucky. You couldn't say monkeys. And don't ask me why. There was no explanation. It was just there. And that was all. Because your dad was a seaman? No. 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 No, you see, it was a strange... It was strange to me, a completely different life. Because although I'd um, known Jim, I'd lived in Scarborough all my life um, until then... And all the, uh, I, I knew a lot of the uh, lads from the bottom, and I went to school with, I mean, I only went to St Peter's down Aubrey Street, and there was a, a few of them at school as well, from fishing families. You didn't pick up on any superstitions from them? No. Or no, them? not really. No. no. Must have been very worrying when he was at sea. He must have worried a lot about how they were getting on and the weather and when they were well, coming home. Must have been quite a worrying time. It, well, it was. It was, yes. But you see, there was a, that was it. That was Jim's job. That's what he did. And there was nothing I could do about that. And so I had to, yes, it, it was your, you know, your own thoughts and thing uh, like that. And you knew that when you married him? Well, yes, of yeah. course I did. Because, and then, because I mean, Jim told me, he said, well, I want to go back to Grimsby. So I went along with it. thought, well, that's it. I mean, that's his job. And um, 
Fair enough. Did you know when they were coming back? Because Jimmy didn't have communication with the boat. So if they were a day late, or, or was that even worrying? Yeah. Mm. Uh. You what, Jim? Sorry. After we were married, the communication was different mm. then. Uh, yeah. Mm. Oh, oh okay. yes. Mm. And that was the only thing is when Matthew was born, and um, he was, uh, as Jim told you, asthmatic, and it. And we couldn't, um, we had to be careful with him, not to let him, get him excited. And that was the, well actually I think that was the only thing that used to bring it on, apart from at t times of year, when it was, you know, a bit, the weather wasn't too good for anybody like that. And um, <coughs> that's it, that was it, I mean it wasn't... Uh, not talking about mm -hmm. communicating then, uh, uh, I remember one time, it was Christmas Day, we were fishing at Faro and it was poor weather and we'd gone in somewhere to shelter to get to uh, our Christmas dinner. And uh, I rung Chris up then through Thor's Haven Radio. She was just preparing for Christmas dinner and we were, we were in sheltering from the weather at, uh, in the Faroes. Which was, was upsetting, you know, it wasn't, yes wasn't it was. It? But uh, it wasn't... I so say you couldn't believe I was so far away. It, no, oh no, it was just like Jim. Well, now, here, speaking like this, it was as clear as a bell. Mm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was amazing. I mean, when we did at first, it was that um, duplex. Duplex, when yes. you start to say over, that sort of thing. Yeah, and then uh, you Eventually went from the subplex, didn't you? Where you could speak. But, um, you know, there were always nice uh, link calls. Okay. Yep. Um, okay, so first, Rachel, what I'm going to do is ask you your name and your date of birth, if you don't mind. No. And will you spell your surname because that sometimes can be misspelled. Yeah. Um, so if you don't mind us doing that, what we're doing no. this for is Scabra Maritime Heritage and Museum Trust. We're doing um, a, co a collaboration, if you like, of uh, stories on superstitions and charms, particularly to do with the nautical marine side of it. So can you yeah. tell us your name and your date of birth and spell your name, please? Rachel Jenkinson Jenkinson, J E. N K I N S O N, twenty six of the third, nineteen forty two. Okay, so now if you'll just tell me any superstitions you know, for yourself as well as for your husband who's a, a fisherman, or f because you come from a fishing family, any superstitions you've been brought up with. Right. And if you know the reasons why, that would be useful. Well, the third one. I can't say it, it was a curly to it. Mm. We always had to refer to a grunter as a curly to it. If we were ever bought any children's books, nursery rhymes, these were removed out of the pages of the book so that we couldn't see them, we didn't say the word. Uh, I think that superstition came about when Christ met the madman and it said he cast, he cast the devil out of him and turned round and saw a herd of swine on the cliff and he put the devil into the swine and the swine ran up the edge of the cliff into the sea. So I do think that. The other one was bunnies. Uh, we used to refer to them as bunnies, but if ever you slipped up and you used right word, you didn't get into so much trouble. And the other one which we used to get serious bother for was long terms. You couldn't say the other word. And I would say then in words with the main three that we never referred to as children, uh, we 
used to go to Sunday school and one day Pants and Nats could they do a trick with me dad. Well they always used to call Pattons now Westleys. They didn't like them about boats and uh, I had a word with the member at Crow and he invited him as a friend. And they were doing now, they were earning salt potatoes. I think it was your Tom that took him. And he had to tell him that finish it was a person. And then Colin's dad used to tell me that when he went to sea, you weren't allowed to whistle. Anybody that was whistling at sea used to get a clip round look because you were whistling wind up. Uh, let's have a break while I think of some more. <laughs> Shall I give you some tips? Yeah. What about, so you said the animals, what, what about birds? Was there anything about birds? No? No. Uh, what about, oh you said about clergy. Oh, yeah, and what, about, what about passing people, like the, the clusters oh, of jets? Yes. You couldn't, my uncle used to turn out, oh, I didn't know Frank, to go into fishing and every morning this poor lady was getting up to go to get in bed in, and she was bought out. And every time that summer they were full of hell because they knew they wouldn't catch up, or thought they wouldn't. And one morning the boat slapped back into her and both of them turned round and went back and wouldn't go to town because of a cross out women, woman. And no way on God's green earth could a woman whistle. Because a whistling woman and a crowing hen will frighten the devil out of his den. So Women were, girls weren't allowed to whistle. Was there anybody else that would be classed as a Jonah, do you think? Like you said a vicar, but was there anybody else that was ever classed as... Give me a tip. I mean, well, such as women on a boat or... Oh, aye, you didn't have women Redheads, on things like that, were they? Redheads and uh, women on a boat. But sometimes... You got a fella that was maybe a bit clumsy or a bit, things seemed to happen around him. Do you know what I mean? Come things on, lucky. always happen around me, mm. like dropping things or. But if it happened about the boat, they'd say it was a journey. And if somebody got a reputation of being a journey, they were given a white birth. And then other times you could have a boat and nothing seemed to go right and everything seemed to be going wrong but for no apparent reason. And they'd say she wants a bump to knock witches out of her. And sometimes they did actually give them a bump to knock the witches out of them. And then if ever you launched a boat, they always used to say, make the bottle break the third's time. It's unlucky if you don't. Well, if you've ever been in that position where the bottle hadn't broken the first time, you'd sort of pray that she won't be unlucky. You beg she won't be unlucky. And you do try and make light of it. And we once went to a boat launch and we were all travelling up on boats. And for some reason, a crow took its time doing it, but flew directly into windshield. And it was dead and it led. And everybody held their breath as if it was such a bad omen. How did it dwell? 
And when we went to launch the boat, it was proud. My mother launched it and had to have four goats before she actually put the, broke the bottle. Broke the bottle on it, which put an awful lot of pressure on Colin. But the other pride wasn't unlucky. What is she like? <laughs> <laughs> what about things like, was it particular words or things that you would do that you thought was lucky? Well, personally. Or you thought was unlucky yourself, like spilling salt, etc. Oh, yeah, spilling salt, walking under a ladder. Mm. But when Colin first started going to sleep, when we first got the other Margaret, we called her our Margaret by accident. I wanted to call her Nil Desperando. And the fellow was there on the phone ringing plates up to see if we could have Nil Desperando. Never despair. And he said, no, it's taken uh, in English waters. And Colin said, we'll call her after you. So I said, no, what about I want Agra? Meaning, if you call her after me, we have a daughter. And as I said, no, what about I want Agra? The man said, I want Agra. And the other fella said, yes, and that's how she got named. Oh, right. Did he say, what were we uh, talking about? Oh, oh, when I came back, Shirley Rowley yeah. wanted to go to see this fortune teller. Well, I don't do much with poetry, but she was adamant. So we, she was good, she said, and all right. So we went. I went with her. And I don't know what she told Shirley, but she come out and I was just waiting in the waiting room. And she says, you're going on a new venture. And I looked at her and she said, you've got a new boat. I see a boat. Call it Gypsy. And I thought, because she was new to town, but she must have known us from. Anyway, she said, take this. And it was a silver ball like a bobby. I said, no, she says, yes. And as long as you keep it the right way, your husband will always do well. But I'm not telling you which way it's the right way. <laughs> I found out. And I know it sounds stupid if ever Colin's been at sea and he's room up to say, is bald straight to her? We aren't doing that, and I moved that ball to where it should be. It, so, there is something in things, and I'd never ever part with that silver ball. So now you know which way is the right way, do you? Definitely. Because <laughs> <laughs> the lady before was saying that silver was unlucky in her family. She wasn't allowed to wear silver fish or silver jewellery. No, no it's it's not silver jewellery, it's just silver, silver, fish. silver fish. She wears silver jewels, she had it, right. silver earrings in, but okay. it's just and silver you'd fish. See, the other thing is, Pisces is the sign of the fish. My brother got up and called it Piscean. And a gypsy told him not to call it Piscean because it was a sign of the fish, but the fish were both swimming the opposite way. So he wasn't so lucky with these. No. It, 
It's a very funny thing when you're having a boat built, you sort of protect them somehow. And the other thing, of course, which has gone from generation, if the boat's launched and there's blood on it, well, then they always say she's no good. And like light boat, the first launch with the, it broke a lad's leg, cut it all on. And then every launch after that, there was something else. Somebody lost three fingers. And all old fishermen used to stand and say, well, there's blood on her, best get rid of her. But that is a very big superstition. What about colours? Is there particular colours? Well, I look at it like this. God made the earth, and on it he put a beautiful blue sea. And on it he gave us Mother Earth and did a green. Now most boats are black, blues, red. Very, very few was green. But all our boats have been green and yet green is considered in most parts up and down the coast as a very unlucky colour. But for us, it's been a very lucky colour. I don't think you'd ever have one in the other colour, though, would it? No. <laughs> um, the numbers of the boats as well, are they, are they always have a seven in or something, is that right? I would try. Yeah. I mm. would do. Mm. <laughs> Why is that? Because it's always seen lucky. The first time was the Amma Margaret that we had built and a number was one three and all I could see was thirteen looming up and I said you've got to stick a seven on the end of that to take the thirteen off her and they did. Well the next one was the Amma Rachel and she was ninety seven. Then there was the heritage, which was 237. The next one should have been, it would have come to 13, you know, again. So we went for 77 and did it that way. But the original 7 went because the book would have been 13, you know. Mm. Our Margaret, of course, is the boat that Tom had as well, or ended up with, yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. I've read somewhere that they also, when they built the boat, sometimes they put a coin yeah. in or something lucky yeah. into the boat. Yeah, they usually put a coin under the mast or on the keel itself uh, when we had Endeavour built and they put a main mast in right down to keel there's a coin between there and the mass that the mass goes over a silver coin a silver coin i think it was a pound coin <laughs> so maybe something in not using silver mm. say there yeah. and uh, the other boat not ours but my brother's had a gold suffering mm -hmm. Parade. What about things linked with going to sea? You know, did, was there any charms or any rituals you did before Colin went to sea? Or I know you didn't go on a Friday. He did. He did, though, didn't he? He did. And he, he did broke, go on a Sunday. He broke all rules and regulate. The one thing that we were taught never to do. When you were knitting fishermen's jerseys, you got the woolen hanks. So you'd sat and rolled it, you'd say, wound it. Never after six o'clock. Never. Because after six o'clock, 
you will wind in sailors to the bottom at sea. So my aunt Alice, my grand and all then would not wind any wool after six o'clock and we certainly weren't allowed to. What do you think the six, what was important about the six? I think then? it was because that was when it was coming really it was dark. Dark, dark in the weather then. Mm. Yeah. Uh, as I say, is there any superstition before he used to go to sea? Was there anything that he would, or you would prepare before he went to sea? Like, as I say, he, wouldn't, he did sail on a Friday, he did sail on a Sunday. But was there any other things that he would do before he went? No. I don't think Did he carry so. any charms, or did you carry any charms? No, the only charm we ever had was glass bulbs. Or your number seven? Well, number mm. seven on both, yeah. But Colin used to say that this superstition about grunters was a load of, you know. Mm. I understand where people come from with it, but when you've been brought up that that is a taboo word, you find it very difficult to use. You do. And he was at sea and he had gear down and he was on a wreck. And he turned, no, they were trolling, but something, he was full of an thing, and he turned round and he called her, the boat, a green grunter. And she dropped all the lots, all the gear, the bobbins, the doors, everything. Just come tight, pull back, and he lost the lot. And when he come in, he said, I'll never call her it again the longest day I live. They got it back, but she dropped the lot. And he said, it's the first time I've ever the called her name. I had been lapsed. Why did they call a ship a she? Well, because, because women aren't allowed on boats. So women why? aren't allowed on them. And I support every part of them. It's like a woman, isn't it? It's the same as a fishing net, you get buttons, you get legs, you get... I know fellas have seen, but they don't have buttons and then they'll talk about bellies and <laughs> wings and... You feel quite good, really, because you think, oh, the clotting hunts as if we've got wings now. But no, I think it's because they really do think a lot about the boats, mm. all of them do, and they could hardly call it a he, not a man, couldn't talk lovingly about a he, so it's a she. What about um, actions or habits that improve the chance of catching fish? Was there anything like that? Well. They all used to have a complaint before they went to sea and so-and-so would get so-and-so somewhere. And Colin always used to say, and my dad said it as well, you don't want to know where anybody's caught a lot of fish. You want to know where they haven't caught fish. If they've caught a lot of fish, they've had it, it's gone. But if they've been to a certain place and haven't caught fish, you know there's none there in any case. So before they went, they were always on phone from one part to another to another, uh, talking about what so-and-so had got, what they had got. All like that, so it gave them an idea of where to go. Don't the fish move about though? I thought fish swim. Well, my father in law always used to say fish had fins. They, when they used to go landing and they got a good shot, you used to bait like hell and think, oh, we'll double that tomorrow and put more bait on hook and all right a bit. They go to the same spot, they come in with an and that's when my father knew 
he used to say fish are things. But you could say about fish moving, yeah, but they'd get a mark on the plotter or whatever and they know that that's where the fish is. So mm. the fish is going to be there for a while. Mm. I don't know how and why it stays there, but that's how they can get it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But they get it all marked up and it's in a certain area. Um, do you think the sea has a spirit then? Do, pe do people, fishermen, feel that it's like a, you know, is it is it, is it like an animal or is it, is it a, a god or a spirit? Is there something in the sea that you respect? And, and I think it's I think it's something that anybody would be extremely foolish if they didn't respect. But I think speaking. Of for instance, with Colin, he went to see all his life from being about seven year old, younger with his dad, on trips and brought back. He retired. We were going to take it easy, so we had a replica of Captain Cook's Endeavour built, half sounds, but a genuine replica. Sailed around to Whitby for nine years. By this time, he was 75. His hip had crumbled and his a nerve in his back had gone, so he had to have operation. And while he was getting better, we sold the pride. He had a fortnight sat round this table and he said, I'm going to get a fishing boat and go back fishing. I said, why? He said, well, if I don't, I'm just sat waiting for God, and I don't want to do that. Mm. So at 76 years old, he's out at sea now, still fishing, and he loves it. And but he didn't actually have that one built, did he? No. So what's the number of that one? Oh, bit sudden. <laughs> <laughs> so he had the number changed. He got the number. <laughs> yeah. But that's... He couldn't do anything else. I mean, he said himself the other day, he's a very fortunate man because each job is his hobby, his life. He loves it. But he really knows what he's doing. Mm. And he is the most respected fisherman in Scarp by far. Apart, Rachel's dad used to be like that, didn't he? Mm. But he loves it because he loves it so much. He puts everything he has into it. And one of my proudest moments was he brought pride in. There was him, my son and my grandson, all on the same boat, all together. And somebody took a photograph of them, and my grandson had it uh, framed mm. in it and gave us it for Christmas. And I thought that was going to play three generations. That'd be a nice photo to, mm. if you let us have mm. a copy at Maritime Shop. Yeah, good. That'd be a nice copy, uh, mm. one. Full generations, yeah. So Rachel now has a son and a grandson, let's say. Mm. Do they follow any superstitions? Or is it, do you think it's just an old person's thing now? I think it, what was drilled in with us, mm. and as our generation grew up, it was scoffed. Mm. I mean, the modern acts, the books, that much. Uh, a lot of the superstitions you didn't have to use, mm. like whistling and all such as that. They had engines. They got engines. You, you used to say you can't whistle, you whistle for wind. Or somebody can whistle because they need it for sale. Well, that engines took over and but there are quite a few I could name that still believe a boat can get a witch, that she needs a knock mm. to get witches out of that. 
and but I think the next generation don't sort of scoffs at it. We perhaps started the scoffing. Mm. They carried it on and say I'm a Williams age, don't believe in it at all. Nothing? Well, I think they had their own little... What do you call a boat a PIG? No. No. <laughs> no, I don't think you would. No. No. Even human? Mm. No. Definitely not. No. And I think uh, they are things like they'll do, you know. Have a ritual. When I go to a dog show, I, I went to a dog show at Crubs and uh, you have to look smart at Crubs. And I looked smart and I had new socks on, new trousers at top, and a pair of new, brand new knickers, all bay, pink, polka dot, navy blue polka dot. And she got first in the class. I couldn't believe it. So when I went to the next show, I put, they'd been washed and everything, <laughs> I put these clean, pink, navy blue polka dot because on. She won. So I said, I, I thought to myself, I am not going without those pink navy blue <laughs> <laughs> And I worked it between two pair of knickers, those <laughs> and a striped pair. If I wear the striped pair, she gets second, maybe first. If I wear the polka dot pair, she gets first. <laughs> so what do the lads do? In, in well, they maybe there? have a pair of gutting gloves or a jumper or a cap or the wet cap back to front. Or certain knives. And or, yeah. Mm. Things like that. They just use certain knives on oh, the lucky, and things lucky like knife. That. Yeah. Or a... yeah. Like they were lucky for me, so I knew I wear those. They might have a lucky knife for a lucky cap or something like that. They all pair the knives down to how it feels for them. Mm. So you could you wouldn't use somebody else's knife when you're at sea, mm. you use your own because mm. you're used to that knife. Tom didn't use anybody else's name. You see, I've known Colin, second man at sea, for not having a good thing name for him. Hmm. You, you know, he said a fisherman's no good if he hasn't a good thing name. And he, he has sat some more. I mean, when, when you talked about this silver silver bowl, then that that's uh, the, 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 the right way up thing. When you say there's something in it, what what, what is that something then that brings luck? What do you? you know, I have no idea uh, whatsoever. I think half the luck. Well, I, I'm sure ninety eight percent of luck is exactly what you believe in. If Colin had rung up and I'd said, oh, balls all cut screw. No wonder we aren't catching that. And then you put it as it should be. It alters the vein and, you know, he thinks, oh, maybe it look will change. It's what you believe. It doesn't do anything. But you believe it. That's to me what luck is. That you believe a certain. Like going to a dog show, I feel more confident knowing I've got them lucky things on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if somebody gave you another ball, a silver globe ball, whatever you want to call it, and it was exactly the same, I wouldn't part with the one I've got. It, it wouldn't make the difference. No. If you if that one got lost. You wouldn't replace it by another? No. Because it wouldn't have the same meaning for you? No. No. So and that, that one that we have, if ever Colin stopped going to see, I would give to my son because he's going to see and he knows 
the times we've set her up at Ball Street, do this with Ball. So you don't think it's... Um, what was I going to say there? So it, 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 there is a superstition with that, definitely. Yeah. Do you think it's maybe the gypsy didn't put a curse on it, she put a, a, a best... What did the gypsy do to make to convince you? She just told me to have it. Right. She says it'll be lucky for you. When you find how to, and you, I don't know if it was the boat and Colin that was a good fisherman, but the glass ball, the silver ball, took the credit at first. Do you see what I mean? Oh, this is lucky. It's got a good trip today. So you definitely do what that is a superstition for you, yeah. For us, yeah. yeah. yeah definitely. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just, uh, I, I always kind of think back because about storms, you know, we did an exhibition about the uh, 1880 storms when a lot of fishermen mm -hmm. lost their lives. And in those days, as you said, they didn't have the equipment, they didn't have the weather forecasting, a radio. So they must have been very superstitious or you would take any possible lucky charm you could, basically, mm -hmm. because they didn't actually know whether the weather was going to get bad or, you know, now we do, don't we, so... Well, we said they didn't know, but Colin's dad, and my Uncle Bob as well, it could be really calm like this, on a night and they'd look up at the mountain and they'd say, we're going to get a blow tomorrow and a good one. Or we're going to get bad weather in two days' time. And it'd be perfectly normal. And honestly, they could tell you, and there was a lot more men like them, they had to look at the sky mm. and look if it's calm down here, uh, without a breath of wind, and you look up into the sky and you see clouds rushing past, but there's no wind where you are, you know that you're going to get some wind coming. They would say there were circles around the moon. That was a short sign of bad weather. And a different sort of glow around the moon meant a lot of snow. And I can remember when I was a bit and I used to say, but how do you know? And they'd say, well, look. Look at what you'd see. But a lot of them, a lot of men that went to see could tell whether, mm. like that, they had to. They had nothing else. Mm. When the birds started putting wildlets in boats mm. for forecasts, I remember baiting in warehouse and hearing them talk, and they used to say that one parrot called up and said, Oh, that fella on that programme said wind was going to come from north. What's he say on yours? And they, could, they didn't realise that it was all the same they were all getting. <laughs> you know, they thought it was a little man in a box telling them. They were in different areas. <laughs> but, I yeah, mean, that, that is true, I mean... It, Years ago, like mm. the, you've asked there about um, the different equipment they have nowadays. Yeah, years ago, when the when like forefathers, it was just their knowledge, mm. and that's why the knowledge is then passed down generations. Mm. And some of the younger generation can pick up on that knowledge, mm. can't they? Like Bill Pashby was telling mm. us Norwegian about the judges, Norwegian judges, the and, the, and the on green, the horizon. and mm. seeing the green and mm. things in the sky. He could that's tell, a sign of wind. yeah, he could tell just by doing that. Mm. And a lot of them, uh, the older generation, or like Colin's generation and Tom's generation, they can tell mm. just sometimes by mm. looking at the sky what's going to happen tomorrow. Mm. And nine out of ten, they're right, aren't they? I would say nine out of ten, don't mm. they? Yeah. 
and it's just knowledge that's passed mm. down generations. So I, I don't think equipment has a great deal to do with that type of thing. Mm. Do you agree? It does now. Mm. I mean, you know, Endeavour came to Whitby. Mm -hmm. The, the Oscar, big Endeavour. The big yeah. Endeavour came to Whitby. And she was recalled to Australia. Mm. So she got to Great Barrier Reef and they were all waiting. Up. No, she got to Harbour that she was going in. And there was a fertility of boats waiting to welcome her. All dignitaries on shore waiting. Now, he had aboard that ship, Sona, plotters and echometer. He had everything to tell him what was under the water. Captain Cook himself had a lead line that he threw over the bank and pulled back. With all these boats and dignitaries waiting, the endeavour ran aground and she couldn't move for days. Now, Captain Cook did it, but yet with all that apparatus, it's still only as good as the people that use it. Yeah, that's true. Okay. I don't know what we've actually, I think, are we all right now? So you haven't mentioned the cold cows, have you? Cold cows? Yeah, so you, you know about cows. Babies, babies cows and things, and how lucky, unlucky. What would you say about them? Our first baby was twins, a boy and a girl. Unfortunately, the little boy died. But he was born with a veil over his face. And they always say, if they're born with a veil over the face, they never drown. Now, right, wrong, and indifferent, this veil was saved. And an old fisherman, well, it stopped going to sea. One day came and knocked on the door and asked if I'd sell him it. Well, I wouldn't. But he said, I said, but why would you want something? He said, because whoever owns that, the, the can't drown, the never drown. But I always thought it was if they were born with one over the face, they couldn't drown. But anyway, we saved it. And you still have it? Mm -hmm. Tom's dad was born with a cow, or he always told me he was, and he said it meant he would never drown. Mm. But Tom said, well, I didn't know that. But I said, I'm sure it's in your dad's house somewhere. I'm sure mm. he showed me it one day. And he'd had one or two clothes. He had one yeah. or two <laughs> clothes yeah, shaved, like didn't he? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So... The other thing was about, we were talking about stirring to about clockwise things or yeah. things on the right and left, whether sort of clockwise thing was better luck than anti-clockwise or right was better than left. No. Or crossing when, knives or no. cutting things. Oh, you don't cross knives. You don't do that. That's a sign of a fool's girl argument if you cross a knife. Mm. You don't have to put shoes on the table. Sh shoes. And you never ever buy a friend a pair of shoes because they walk away from you. It's like walking away with friendship if you do. It's the same as giving a purse, it's got to have silver. Yeah. Why is that significant about giving babies silver as well? I don't know. Because they always used to say put silver in a baby's hand, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. First time you saw it. I never understood why. Mm, then that's good fortune. Get a bit more than a penny. Because <laughs> <laughs> we saw Scott, we saw Scott do the other day, and Tom gave him a note for, and I went, "You're supposed to put silver." And he went, "I didn't have any silver, so I gave him a note." So I said, "Oh well, it'd be better." <laughs> but I think that was the. But that used to be an old way of yeah. saying, didn't it? You had yeah. to, you had to put silver in mm. the palm of the hand. But I never understood why. But there, I'm, I was telling Tom. 
you should have given silver. You know, and he said, I didn't have any silver, so they got a note, that's better. And I went, I know, but I it's supposed to be lovely silver. I think silver, it was to up it from mm. rats. No, mm. <laughs> 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 oh, I don't. Yeah. What was that? The, the stirring your tea, sort of oh, yeah. clockwise or... or, or oh, the... when a bowl is built, all boats, I think I'm safe in saying, are built for right-handed people. So everything is at hand to the right. We have two sons and a daughter. Both sons were left-handed and the daughter was right. And Colin, it used to drive Colin crackers because it was so awkward them being left-handed. Anyway, they got round it. But you see, making a, a net even braiding, you go that way with your right hand and that way coming yeah. back. Yeah. A left-handed person has to go that way and that way coming back, which makes... But I think that's why everything was done to... Right. Right. Mm. Yeah, yeah, again, yeah, Tom's dad was left-handed and he used to bang it awkward sometimes. Yeah. And Tom said that when you step on a boat, you should step on with your right foot. With your right foot, yeah. But, but that's just a superstition mm. that's been handed down. As I said to you before, his dad and his granny were really superstitious. Emma, it was terrible. What about church and a baby? Oh, my. If you had a baby, and this happened to me, uh, you went in hospital, you come out before you went home. With that baby, you had to stop in the church. They used to say and be churched. But what the men what you went in and thank God for your safe delivery of the baby and yourself. And then you could go home. But I've seen my mother refuse to have lattice in with the new baby because they hadn't been in church first. But they was, we were lucky because we had Bethel, so on the way home you could pop in Bethel and go home and not upset anybody. But a lot of them were like that. They wouldn't have you in if you hadn't been to church. Mm. Yeah, Emma wouldn't have me in their house till I'd been. No. With baby. Yeah. You had to take baby with you. And if you had to leave baby in the hospital, you had to go yourself. And when the baby come out, then you had to go again. With the baby. Then you had to go and have it christened. But being churched was not to do with being christened. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing was about washing clothes, wasn't it, while the men were at sea? Did, did, did but you... again, I think it's an older person. It okay. was Chris Sheeder who said she would never wash on that when the husband was at sea, on the day he was going to sea. Yeah, I am. Because you're washing him away. Yeah. But I, I think it's, an, it, it's a generation back mm. again, and, mm. and as yeah. I say, she's... Wedding in eighty, didn't she, sir? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Lovely, yeah. yeah. Happy. Yeah, fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Do it. Don't go away. Okay. Do Thank it. You. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. No, uh, she can tell. Mm, yeah, and nice and clearly yeah, as well. That's yeah. good. You know. It's, um, but again, there's some different. Slightly different mm, things again. Yeah, the wool. So I think After six o'clock, because she was she saying said that, there was something about wool, but it. she was the winding. She mm. was left to right mm. winding, wasn't she? Mm, but, maybe, but she knew there was something to yeah. do with wool and she couldn't think yeah. what it was. Yeah, that's wow. interesting. So about I'm just saying it's interesting. Thing. Yeah. Like Shirley Oak said, there was something to do with wool, but I can't remember what it was. She said, I think it was, you couldn't, you had to wind it left to right or right to left or... Wind it up to six o'clock, <laughs> and not on a Sunday. You couldn't knit on, on a Sunday. That's, she did yeah. say that, didn't yeah. she? Yeah. So everybody who we've interviewed, 
has added told a little us something different. different. Mm. So like Shirley said, uh, oh, I'm only going to tell you the same as everybody else. I said, no, you won't. Everybody's mm. told us something different. Mm. Have I? Yes. Yeah. 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 Quite a few Very things, actually. Yeah. yeah. So we need old paper for Rachel oh, to start yeah. as well. Oh, that's that's wonderful. <laughs> thank you. Now I'll get you to sign that as well then. So, all right, thank you. Yeah. When did you uh, publish this then, Rachel? When did you... Um... When did I publish it? Two years ago. Two years ago. Two years ago. Two years ago. Was it yeah. two years ago? I think it says it in it yeah. somewhere. In that's, front of me. you on the back there with yeah. your hand yeah. in your hands, yeah. Half of it's a, like a childhood and growing up, and yeah. half of it's a dog life. Yeah, I've read the first life. couple of chapters, and I got, it, I got it out last week, so I was going to start and, yeah. An oh, endeavour. Thank you. An endeavour, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, half of it's your vision, and half of it's your, yeah. your dog yeah. things, yeah. yeah. So. Did somebody spur you on to do it, or was it always in your head to well, do it? Well, no. What happened was... Rachel, could I cut you yeah, where is it? Go through fire door, so it's in office. Go through fire door, go straight to the bottom, to the bathroom. Uh, I joined the writers thing. Yeah. Well, actually, my... There we go. So this is the silver ball. Yes. That we were talking about in the story. And out of everything I own, I think I'd protect this first. And it is just a silver ball, isn't it? Yeah. Well, to us it is. To you it's something totally different. With the fish on oh, the oh, end. Oh. And it's the right way up. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly is. Because it's at sea. Because it's at sea. Oh, so it just catches the audio. Anyway. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, what we're doing this for, Jim, is for Scarborough Maritime Heritage and the Museum Trust. Mm -hmm. So can I just ask you to say your name and your date of birth, if you wouldn't mind? <laughs> and will you spell your surname for us? Oh, I don't need that. I don't, don't think I'd need that in Scarborough. No, well, it's just <laughs> some people might. So. My name is Jim Sheeder. And it's spelled by all the Sheeders. Uh, S-H-E-A-D-R. I never thought I'd have to, have, everywhere else in the world I've been, I've had to spell it, but I didn't think I'd have to do it in Scarborough. And you did, and what date you of birth, like a cup of tea? 26, 5, 1921. 26, 5, 1921. No, it was 26 of May, 1921. Brilliant. So, as I explained there, we're trying, we're doing this for the Scarborough Maritime Heritage and the Museum Trust, and we want to talk to people about superstitions. Um, witchcraft, oh. lucky. Are you okay? Oh, Christian. Lucky charms, etc., Jim. So, if you wouldn't mind just telling us a little bit about superstitions. Superstitions, I So, uh, so many really among the uh, fishing fraternity. And, uh, I mean, my particular one is bobtails. I won't say that word for those. But I don't really know why. It's something that's just been handed down. My father was uh, he was a skipper and he was uh, dead against it. But uh, I think it's just a family uh, thing. Other animals I'm not too bothered about. I talk about uh, rats sinking, leaving a sinking ship and that sort of thing, but uh, I've never really experienced it. I haven't had to leave a sinking ship. <laughs> fortunately. For, yes, fortunately. Been uh, close to, but uh, not there. No, 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 I'm just trying to think. Well, superstitions like keeping safe at sea or uh, getting a good catch. Well, yes, uh, whistling, that's another thing. He always said the whistling, not the wind. Oh, and uh, getting a catch, yes, I would never. Uh, Eddie Temple could tell you about some of my superstitions. That I would never plan for the next haul. However much fish we were catching, the next haul I would never plan. I would never let them. Uh, we used to have a, what they call a takele to give if you got heavy fishing. And uh, some people would say, well, keep it handy, all ready for, for the next haul. And I would say, no, stow it away. Don't take, don't plan for the next. What we're going to get the next one? Stow it. We can always unstow it, won't we? 
want to get the fish aboard. And Fridays, I never still liked sailing on Fridays. And, and yet, strangely enough, with our maiden boy to these two ships here, when we took those, we took delivery of those on the Friday and uh, sailed on our maiden voyages on the Friday. But I, I didn't have any choice in the deal because I, I was only skipper, I wasn't the owner. And that was their, their decision to sail on Friday. I didn't like it. But uh, it is as you've told in those days. It didn't bring you any bad luck though? It, it, it didn't, no, no. I was very fortunate actually. From the time I got my skipper's ticket, I was uh, in Grimsby, fortunately. I was uh, skipper all the time. Some people just got, uh, you know, temporary jobs. But I was fortunate in as much as that. Uh, I was skipper from the time I got my ticket right through until leaving Grimsby to come back to Scarborough. Did, did you ever make preparation to go to sea? Um, example, a lucky charm, or was there a, a routine? Or anything mm. like that to go to sea? I don't recall any particular ones, I mean. What about fears and beliefs at sea then? Did you have any fears or beliefs when it came to the sea? Fears? No, no, I can't say I ever. Uh, I mean, however bad the weather was, I think we always had faith in, uh, you know, that, that you could uh, come through it, you know. And I can't remember having any. Particular fears, no, I haven't much about the weather. Right? So you didn't carry just Saint Christopher? No, just relied on yourself for, to get through it. Relied on your ship and the crew. So was there anything that you sort of tried to do to increase the catch when it comes to luck or that type of thing? <laughs> Try to be in the right place. <laughs> Are there any superstitions where it comes to animals? You've already said about yeah. curly tails and long tails. That's right, and, isn't it? Um, what about meeting people or certain things you would do? Um, yes. Well, <laughs> I, I didn't uh, have any particular superstition about that, but uh, I know some of the... Uh, Fishermen that, uh, well, the old time was in Scarborough, really. A lot of them, if they met a person on the way down to sailing, they would turn back again. They wouldn't go to sea. <laughs> and then anybody me, meeting Jimmy Rowley. Who's <laughs> 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 in <laughs> They would go back home again rather than go to sea. Oh, <laughs> oh fingers. And you said about whistling, was there any other particular thing like touching iron or cutting your nails on a Friday or oh, no, things no. like that? No, no, no. no, no it didn't affect me anyway. I bet there's so many that uh, different people have, but uh, I can't say any of those affected me. What about colours? Colours, I like green. But I don't like uh, we don't like it aboard the ship, and we didn't like women going aboard the ship. But until until the latter part of the time, when Chris, when we got these new ships, they uh, they always came aboard to. Uh, I mean, when we were when we came in from sea, when we were carrying the bond, as you saw, you know, and uh, when we were sailing deep water, we always carried the bond, and you had to. The customs came on board to clear the ship when you came in dock. And in very the, the skipper was the one that had to stay to clear it. All the rest of the crew went on. But our wives came down. And uh, of course, it was a, we usually probably waiting an hour or so before we could get down. So they used to come on board, you know, to meet us at that particular time. And usually the family, but... My son suffered from asthma. It was very bad asthma, and the doctor found we, we always found that he was ill when I got home. And the doctor thought it was psychological, and he decided that uh, not to 
to Chris not to tell him that I was coming in until tied up to the time. And you're right, Chris. Well, yeah, until we're actually yes. on our way down the dock. I, well, I used to ring up to tell Chris we were coming home, but she couldn't tell him our map because it used to upset him so well, much. He used to get excited. And, and he brought his time, asthma on. By the time Jim got home, he was just like a little uh, wet rag, you know, in bed. So, and I thought that one myself, really, and then the doctor told me, so I thought, oh, well, I was thinking on the right lines. Mm. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't say to Jim, don't ring up. Um, you know, I thought, well, I can't say that. Don't ring up. I thought, and it's, <laughs> you know, it was rather difficult, that was, that bit. Anyway, the doctor mentioned it, so I mm. thought, oh, God, that relieves me from having to say it. Mm. And um, mm. no, never. So, so just what we're doing, I said, oh, we're going, your dad's in dock, we're going down to meet him. And that was it. We got down the dock and met Jim before it had a chance to get him going. What about things like upturned things, like a broom? They, they used to say, come put a broom a certain way. No? No. Uh, what about good luck charms? Like a cow? What? Oh, I've, no, I haven't had any experience of that. No, but you've Perfect, heard of it. of course, yeah. yeah. That say that the crap, the, the, anyone that carries one of those never drowns at sea. Mm. And that business about fishermen not being able to swim, I think that's a load of rubbish as well. <laughs> The majority of the people that I know could swim. So I've gone through a list, I think. You're not thinking it? about going overboard anyway. No. <laughs> <laughs> so you talked about this person that was unlucky. That what, 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 Why did people avoid him? Had he, had he had bad luck in the past? He, he was, yes. He, he seemed to... Uh, he, he, was, he, was, he was a nice lad, actually. But uh, he just seemed to have that... Uh, Aura about me. No one would. Uh, I don't think he ever sailed out to Scarborough. I don't. They, people wouldn't carry him. I mean, he was a local lad and, and uh, relative to uh, Lindy and Tom. But, uh, I mean, a nice enough lad, but uh, it was just a. Uh, well, they said it was a Jonah. Yeah. That's the only one I've known here, actually. We didn't have them in. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we had any Ingram, but we had a, a, such a big turnover of crews in, in Grimsby. We, in Scarborough, we tended to keep the same crews for years and years. Although most of the ships I was in, we kept them good uh, length. Now. I mean, our local lad, Eddie Temple, was mate with me for about ten years. Did they have any said. superstitions, your crew? Did any of your crew have superstitions that they would... Uh, no, 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 no. Nobody worried about them. <laughs> I wouldn't, no. So you don't but, know that uh, they carried good luck charms or anything? No, not to my knowledge, no. Only that, uh, no, I can't recall any of me. What about your parents? Did, were they superstitious? Well, that business of not washing when uh, the day you sailed, that was a definite one. I think they all, most fishermen's wives stuck to that and sweeping up when they went away, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Well, but you didn't the, sweep up. Mm, that's right. Well, you were sweeping you. Mm. But really, it, uh, I don't recall a great deal of, uh, of that. Do you think the women were more superstitious than the men then? I don't know. It's, it's difficult to say. It's, um, as I say, I'm... I'm uh, torn between Scarborough and Grimsby. I, I'm, you know, I was only eight years of age when I went to Grimsby, and previous to that, I'd, I'd always been on the bottom end. I was born in Longbury Steps, which is only a stone's throw from the harbour, so we were down. To, in fact, I think I was about three years old when they uh, they found me in my granddad's bunk. I was going to hoping to go to sea with him. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, a youngster did that, didn't they? In, in those days, spent so much time down there, and the uh, people would. I mean, I, 
old, uh, what do you call him, uh, George, well then. Uh, I was thinking about Scarborough, man. Yeah, Scarborough. Oh. <laughs> one, one the old, old uh, pudding, Appleby. They all said he taught me to walk by holding my braces in his mouth and walking me on the table and that sort of thing. You know, those uh, closely knit uh, families. Uh, they hadn't much money, but uh, we did see life. <laughs> but, uh, yes, it was... Uh, everyone knew everyone else. I mean, Scarborough now is widespread, you know, is a different uh, area altogether now. I mean, it's more like a yacht marina now, isn't it, rather than a fishing port. We, uh... Do you have any particular... Do you have any tattoos, Jim? No, don't. I don't believe in it. Oh. What's that? I don't, I don't, I don't like them. Right. What's that, Jim? Hmm? Tattoos. Oh, oh no. Oh. No. Do you have anything yeah. about the weather? Were you very superstitious about red sky in the morning or red sky at night? How, how did you judge the weather? Well, I think a lot of those things just came with experience. I mean, when uh, sometimes when we used to work at Fair, we'd be on Fair Bank, which was about 40 miles off from the main uh, islands, and sometimes you got a, a feeling that the weather was going to turn really bad. And it was more instinctive than anything. And uh, I remember telling Eddie Temple one time, he was mating me, and it was beautiful weather at the time, but I said to him, I said, see that string on the whale back, Eddie? I said, if that starts to move, give me a shout straight away, we'll get in. And by the time we got into the island, it was blowing a hooligan. And we were glad to, but it, it wasn't any particular thing, it was just an instinct, which you get, you get... You know, in, in, the weather, you think, think that's it, it's time we were going. Mm. But uh, it, it was not so much what it was like um, with with fishing. I mean, it's just experience. I mean, we we didn't have the, uh, the aid that they have now. I mean, we had echo sounders and that sort of thing. But we're uh, just coming recently with the... You know, the sort of navigational aids. It, it's a total now. I mean, <laughs> Scar Scarborough, coming back to Scarborough, I mean, I, it was like coming back, coming on your holidays when I come to Scarborough after being at Grimsby, deep water fishing. But particularly then again, when the sailing out of all just after the war, the conditions there were at atrocious. We sailed under there. I don't think nowadays no one would put up with those conditions when we were fishing out of hole because they were, we were deckies then and uh, when we went to places like Bear Island and White Sea, I mean it was winter time, it was freezing an inch a minute, you know, and it was really bad. You had to pull the gear aboard sometimes because there was so much ice and simply couldn't fish because they you were covered with ice. And you would spend your time chopping ice away before you could actually hold it. And then when sometimes when when you were fishing, when you were actually fishing, when the net come on board, they were having to spray hot water hoses on the net so it was soft enough to pull it in. And the fish was had. I remember built my local lad Harry Horswick, you remember Harry Horswick? He was uh, we were fishing out of hull and uh, we used to work 18 hours on deck and six below. In theory, sometimes your meal times come out to those six hours on deck. But it was, there was so much fish about then that it was constantly fish coming on board for the full 18 hours that you were working. And uh, the, uh, the conditions there were so bad <laughs> sometimes that uh, you were stood, you know, in, in the pound, gutting. And I remember Horswick, he'd bought, bought, somebody had given him a Trilby hat, cut Robin, an old uh, sailor. He, he didn't go to sea, but he was a RN, from the RN. And he'd given Harry this Trilby hat. And I was fishing one, one day and it was, you know, water was splashing aboard and it was a bit, uh, bit chilly. And Harry said, uh, he said, my knife's 
my knife blunt, the fish is hard, she's spitting at me all the time, he said. I wish Cock Robin was under this bloody hat instead of me. <laughs> but, but that was it, it was and and when you when you got in, they'd say the ship's husband would say, Are you going again? We'd be saying playing up hell all the time we're at sea. But when the ship's husband said, Are you going again? Of course we are, you know. Yeah. When you had Bobby Till to come. But uh, those uh, conditions as I say when you when you were uh, with the ice, it was really bad. And uh, of course it was dark 24 hours a day, or 24 hours a day and night. But look, different again, when, when you were working down there in summer, it was daylight all the time, 24 hours daylight at Bear Island. So it, uh, and it was quite comfortable then. But you see, with those, in those days just after the war, there was so much fish about, they just used to used to fill the ships up every time. They wasn't weren't searching for fish. It was there. In fact, the op all, all the ships carried operators, and uh, they had to keep in touch with the office. Kept them, and uh, <laughs> the uh, operators uh, they were catching cod on one particular area, and they'd probably get a message from the office to say, "You've got enough cod. We don't want any more cod. Go and catch some haddocks." And you'd probably steam about 12 hours and you'd be getting had it then. But one of the big bugbears at that particular time was they were catching so much fish that they, they headed them, headed all the fish because there was, they were uh, filling them up. And as you know, with cod, they're the biggest part of them is head on them. So what they decided to do then was head all the fish. So you're saving them with heads up. The only trouble was, when you'd had your 18 hours on deck, you're half the time, you're liable to be throwing the head down the fish room and the body overboard. But uh, it, it was really, uh, you know, the, the, you had different styles of heading. But, uh, you also have an, an iron across the hatches and you'd be one more in the middle heading. And then decided that wasn't fast enough, so everybody had to do their own heading the fish. So, it, you had to nick them and so on. But uh, it seems such a shame because it, uh, it, it come back on them, that business, because those, uh, the heads, they polluted the sea like they've done it now with sending, putting fish back. It, it, it does a, you know. What age were you when you went to sea, Jim? Pardon? What age were you when you went 14. to sea? What age were you when you finished? 40, oh, I finished at about, what, 65. 60, 65. That's a, a long, mm, a long yeah, career. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so were you ever on boats before they had communication, before the sort of radio system? Were you on boats where you, you oh, basically yes, when, were on your own? When I first went skipper, I was in a, a what do you call a bridge off side ship, you know, bridge, bridge off the uh, wheelhouse at the back. That was my first ship skipper, and... Uh, I'd, I'd just got my ticket, Chris was in the hospital actually, but uh, and I'd just got my ticket and they sent for me, someone was, it was Christmas time and the regular skippers tended to have Christmas at home and uh, that was when you got your first chance of a, a skipper's job. So they, the office sent to me and they said we wanted to set a raincoat and I said oh, I was hoping to take a bigger one than that. <laughs> they said one thing, you said lucky you didn't want it all, they said. And, it said, no, don't normally let uh, new skippers practice on our ships. Anyway, took the ship away, and we had we just had a, a receiver, no no transmitter. We had a receiver which was connected to a, a an, one of the aerial for the DF, and that was the reason for having it. And it was just that one in the in the wheelhouse, and it was just purely and simply a receiver. And uh, but. Uh, Funny enough, when to communicate, then we had, we had uh, loud, loud, not loud hailers, you know, megaphone. That was our means of singing out to all the ships, a megaphone. I mean, but, you can understand why people maybe were a bit more superstitious when you didn't have any contact yes, with the land. Yes, that's right, that's right. You were on well, your own, view yeah, yeah. God and yeah. the sea, wasn't it? But was one, it? Of, one of our other ships, one of the other ships came, it spotted me and it came to me, I hadn't seen the other ships during the trip. And, he came to me and uh, sung out, um, 
are you doing any good, Jim? I said, oh, OK. And uh, he said, how much fish have you got on board? He said, give me a blast on your whistle for every ten kit you've got on board. <laughs> that was the way it was. <laughs> which, which I did, I think, with about 80 kit. I said, mate, how much fish have you got on board? Oh, he said, 80 kit. I said, hold on. So I blast, give him eight blasts. <laughs> for the, for the, uh, he said, oh, that's good. Yeah, keep it up. <laughs> See, well, a hard life to move a man. Yeah. Back, further back we go, yeah. the harder yeah. the life, of course. Yeah. Mm. It's easy, it's, easy now, you would say. Yeah, yes. Well, <laughs> I, well we, we thought we'd got the... Uh, when we went in these diesel ships, we thought we'd... we'd but, mm. You know, no coal to worry about. You see, my, the coal burners... I mean, when the... With the... Uh, when I first started going through the fur to hook ferro, we used to carry 25 ton of coal on deck. We could no, no after no after fish room, so we used to ca have to carry extra coal on deck. So we'd carry 25 ton on deck. Well, that was all very well as long as the weather was fine. But if you fit a gale of wind, you found you'd no coal left. By the time you got, by the time you got to the Pentland Firth, you'd no coal. And uh, so then you were dictated. You see, your furrow in those days it was just um, d d dark fishing. There was no, there wasn't a scrap of fish to be had in the daylight. So we. And you conserved your coal. Fortunately, in those days, there was a three-mile limit around the islands, Iceland and Faroe. So during the day, you were fortunate you could nip into one of the ports and tie up there. That preserved your coal. And you were, you could be nipping out and at dark, get your dark in, back in the... which was a good way of preserving your coal. And it was nice and comfortable being in there. <laughs> but you see, the trouble was by the time I finished, they'd push the limits out so far, 20, 25 miles. When they were, when they first started messing with the limit lines, they pushed it out to four miles, and then gradually ten miles, and further and further. But uh, it, it was a doddle of a job. The fur of fishing was very nice, but uh, it. It deteriorated because they were, you couldn't get in that mine. You, you were more comfortable ships, so I suppose it was swings and roundabouts. But uh, I mean, with your speed, when uh, when you had the old coal burners, you were dependent on the engineers for your speed. I mean, they would they, when they were, when you were going away, they liked to take it nice and steady. You know, probably you'd probably do eight knots going away. To wherever, wherever you say them going, coming home, you'd get what you called engineers' fault. You'd probably get ten knots coming home, because they were a bit eager to be getting home. <laughs> they want the game going away, but uh, so that was what we called engineers' fault. And uh, but there again, you see, they could dictate your how long your trip lasted because the, the engineer would say, well, if you're working at Ferra, you've got two nights coal left, give her. So you knew, well, the two nights you'd have to be going home. So the only way you could, uh, you know, get a bit of your own back would shorten your distance, go across, go a bit nearer to home, and get three nights then. But, but uh, it was, uh, you, you didn't like to leave Farrah because, but, because it was always better fish there than the West End. The West End, you never knew what the hell you were going to get. You'd get dogs one hole. Cod the next, and coal is the next all. It was such a, a mixed area. It was a nightmare for the mate in the fish room looking after the fish. Because, I mean, sometimes the, the mate would come up out of the fish room and look up at the bridge and say, what the hell are we going to get this time? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Just hope for the best. <laughs> so, sometimes the sky dictated things. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You see, that was that was another thing we had panic. Eddie Temple actually, he uh, he'd always been uh, in these um, same letters and wine uh, boats here, and he finished with Ben Clark. He came to Grimsby, and although he had the skipper's ticket, it was starting from scratch. So he came deckhand with me in the uh, in the Ross Jaguar, and then the third hand, some months later, six months later, the third hand finished, Edmund came third hand, then the mate 
had finished and he came mate and he put me ashore eventually with Quinsies and he became skipper of the same ship. So he'd won through from Tecum. But that business with the uh, with the mate, the, uh, we had it in at Pharaoh, all our fleet was working for and one of the skippers had been put ashore with, with an illness, he actually died, but the mate hadn't a skipper's ticket, so consequently the ship had to stay in Pharaoh until they got a, a skipper down. In those days they weren't flying to Pharaoh, they, weren't, they had to wait for a, a, a passenger boat to take him. So, after that, they decided that any all the skippers, all the ships that went through the Firth, had to have a, a mate who also had a skipper's ticket, in case anything happened and he could take over. But uh, unfortunately, some you see some of the skippers didn't like that idea because they said, "Well, if he's got a skipper's ticket, he's going to be looking over after my job." Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but. Uh, it was uh, it was interesting little job. I, I I enjoyed it all the time I was fishing. A little job, a little job. <laughs> <laughs> and we've done the interviews with Eddie and Jim. Mm. So we went to uh, yeah. yeah, of course. Say with the you know I, I liked my time at home. We always enjoyed our time at home, but. Uh, and I was a bit reluctant when I was going away, but once we got out there, I was quite happy. And Did you finish it now? Yeah, I do. Right, so that is recording. So, Jim, um, can you just tell me your name and your date of birth? Uh, Jim Spencer. I was born on the 4th of April, 1942. Right, great. And we're here in your home where you're retired now, yeah. and you spent many years as a merchant navy, didn't you, in the merchant navy? Yes, I did. I did, I did uh, 12 years in the Royal Navy and 26 in the merchant navy. Right, wow. And, uh, and at the beginning of that, uh, were, did people uh, tell you about any superstitions when you were going to sea, or did you already uh, sort of know them? What did you know about? Well, there was a few shore side ones, like walking under a ladder and things, but that, I think the worst one I ever fell out was a captain who used to go mad if he heard you whistling. Absolutely crazy. I mean, to me, superstitions aren't. You know, they don't mean much to me, but to him, it's you know, terrible if you, if if, um, if he heard you whistling, you you were out of favour for weeks. Yeah. What did he think was going to happen then? Well, he was whistling up a wind. You see, you're frankly whistling up the wind. And Eddie had experience. Of oh, that, I don't know. I, I don't think so. I mean, whistling isn't going to whistle up the wind, is it? He's going to have experience <laughs> of that. But, yeah. And what happened if he did whistle? Did you just get? Put in the dock or something. Oh no! I just tell you to shut up. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so do you think in the in the merchant navy in the royal navy are, are they less superstitious than maybe the fishermen? No, the merchant navy is quite superstitious, but the royal navy isn't. Not at all. Right. And is that do you think because of the kind of discipline they have? To yeah, be that's probably what it is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So in the merchant navy, what are the typical sort of uh, uh, um, you know superstitions that you might have? Well, one was, there is a superstition about seeing women before you go to sea, but in the Merchant Navy, I, I only come across it once, and, and it was so, <laughs> spell, and it, it was not a female, it was seeing a nun. Right. <laughs> There's something against nuns, I don't know where that one came from. But that, yeah. And that was if you were on your way to the ship? Yeah, boat. on your way to the ship, right. yeah. And what yeah. were you supposed to do if you did see the nun? Well, I don't know, it was just bad luck, I suppose. you just got to expect something terrible <laughs> happening to you. And did anything bad ever happen to you that you felt, uh, you know, was due to a superstition or something? Did you ever have any bad luck that you thought... No, because it was too modern, you see. In, in the olden days, you probably would. Mm. But nowadays, you know what the weather's going to be like anyway, nine times out of ten, if you've got a good forecaster. So you know you're going to get bad weather. If, but if in the olden days, if 
if you uh, if you did see a nun walk and you were walking around the way she, and then you got bad weather, you would probably blame it on her. Mm. Yeah. So. Mm. As you say, there's superstitions on land, aren't there? Like walking under a ladder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, have you always sort of been the kind of person that ignores those things anyway? or No, sometimes I do, but sometimes I, I would walk, I think I would walk round the ladder. If it's, it's probably got a, a can of paint on your head if you walked underneath it. <laughs> well, that's right. A lot of them are very logical, aren't they? There's, there's yeah. certain things that yeah. uh, make sense, don't they? Yeah. Um, so, although you didn't have many superstitions yourself, can you think of other, uh, some of your comrades that might have been more superstitious about where they put things on the boat or how Well, they... one was animals' names. I mean, you know, long-eared things, bunnies and things like that. You wouldn't call them their, their names or, or, or long tails. And little animals, furry animals with long tails you don't mention. Right. Yeah, never uh, mentioned that. And in, a, in um, Weymouth in Dorset, it's everybody. It, it's a very big superstition. You would never say that in in, Dors in in Weymouth in Dorset. Even ashore for some reason. Uh, well, in Portland in Dorset, next to Weymouth, yeah. And do you know why that is? I don't know. It's just... I thought it was very strange when... I, all the, all the people I met didn't, you know, that even if they didn't go to sea, they were, they were very superstitious of mm. some animals. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, is it is it because of the difference between the land and the sea? Then, sort of mentioning things about the land when you're at sea, is that the I don't know. connection? I don't, so. no, I don't I don't think there is really. I can't think of any connection. Right. But uh, I know at sea you never you never mentioned those two particularly. Yeah. A bunny and a, and a long tail one. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, so when you were when you were ready, getting ready to go to sea, were you quite worried about going to? Was it always dangerous? Did you think there was a danger? No, not really. You, 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 ships are built to withstand it. Now, I've always believed that mm. a ship, if a ship is built to withstand that, and and people are trained well enough to know what to do. If anything does happen, like you know, an emergency, and and like the the ships chippy and be, you know, he he would they were always well trained into damage control and things like that, and and there was courses for damage control. There was there was courses for firefighting at sea is very difficult, especially if it happens alongside a jetty, because a a normal fireman wouldn't have a clue. We're, we're about finding his way around the ship at all, and it, that can be dangerous, I suppose. Mm. Obviously, you, ne you never had control of the weather, though. That was always no, a danger. That's right. no, no. Uh, but it, it, it isn't the weather. Ships can withstand very, very bad weather. I, I coming back from America five days before we 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 were expecting this storm. It was, but we were warned about it five days before, and there was a forty foot wall of water, and we couldn't get round it. There was no way, even though we knew about it five days before. There was, you know, to get to where we, wherever we're going, I can't remember now, but there was no way around it, so you just had to batten down and straight into it, and it, and it works, you know. You, you come out the other end. <laughs> yeah. Do people pray a lot? I suppose are people quite religious, maybe? Are they kind of... Uh... Well, people say they don't, but... I bet they do if they get, if they've been in some terrible weather and and it, you, you do start wondering you know and, and things like that and then you, I'm sure they do I'm sure everybody does yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean I think obviously that's where a lot of things like touch wood and, yeah. and throwing yeah. salt over your shoulder yeah. they're kind of um, safety measures aren't they for, for in case bad luck comes along isn't it a lot well of... yeah I suppose it is yeah yeah. Um, Especially years ago when most seamen were uneducated anyway. You know, it, it, was, it was a trade that nobody, you know, you didn't need to be educated in anything else but looking after yourself and the ship. Mm. They always used to say that never carry two buckets at once or anything. One for you, one hand for you and one for the ship, always, you know, mm. going up ladders and things. And, yeah. That yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, so... so Oh, as you say, you you felt quite safe at sea in the ship. Um, yeah. uh, I mean, do you think fish? If you'd have been on a fishing boat, you may have had more superstitions. If you'd have been on a smaller boat, because obviously trawlers and 
uh, you know, smaller boats are more vulnerable, aren't they? Well, they are, but there again, a small ship can bounce about a lot, mm. whereas big ships, the big lumbering things, and they go up and up and up and up, and then when they come down, if they think it's going to break their back, and that, that's frightening, yeah. Yeah. Could you swim? Because there's another superstition about not having been able to swim, isn't there? Yeah, I could swim because when you join the Royal Navy, as a boy, I joined as a boy, I don't know about if when you join up as an adult, but as a boy, that was one of the first things they had at this place where I was at Ganges in Suffolk. They, they had a, a big sort of Olympic sized swimming pool and, and, and you were put in there and you had to wear to make it more realistic you had to wear a white canvas suit and you used to go into the water and they used to say stay afloat for god I don't know how long it was I know it seemed a long time and if you tried to get out you were poked back with a big <laughs> stick <laughs> to, and if you if you were uh, if you did crawl out and, and, and you couldn't do it you couldn't stay afloat you couldn't swim you were uh, you were given them lessons every morning, you know, before everybody else got out of their bed, you were in that swim pool till you, wow. till you'd done the... So you had to learn to yeah, swim, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, what do you think about that, that superstition about fishermen not, not learning to swim? Do you think that's... Well, it's a bit silly, isn't it? I mean, like I said, it all, be, it, it all stems from long ago, when... People were, were, you know, all seamen were ignorant, but, and 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 nowadays you'd just laugh at something like that, wouldn't you? Mm. Nowadays, I don't, I don't think you'd find a, a modern fisherman would be that bothered. It's, mm. been, it's superstitious. I mean, but there's some plenty of people are superstitious mm. now. Like I said, I, I wouldn't walk under a ladder if I could walk round it. Mm. But you know, I don't know why. I've mm. no clue why. Mm. Yeah. Do you do you think? I mean, do you, a lot of fishermen thought the sea was sort of a, like a being, like a, well, not a god, oh. but a, a Neptune, and, you know, it, it was yeah. almost a... I'm sure every uh, did. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you feel that the I sea mean, has like a that. character? It has a... Well, that crossing the land ceremony when you cross the, the, the equator, mm. you, it's a big thing, it still is. It's been a big thing for God knows how long, isn't it, when you, you have to get permission to cross the equator of King Neptune and all this... Mates and that. Did that happen to you then? Oh, it happens to everybody who crosses for the first time. You find out who, you know, who's never crossed the the, the line before, and, and it, you know, you so they all they have, have a special everybody. ceremony. Yeah, everybody has to go through. What what did the ceremony involve? Did it? Uh... Well, it involved getting your head shaved and things, mm. and you know, and uh, tipped into the water by a load of. Men and things, you know, yeah. big men. I forget what they were called, but they were, they were big bullies. Men. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you remember it quite well then, yeah. your first yeah. crossing. And since then, you've probably crossed the equator a oh, lot yeah, of times, times, have you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just a few times, yeah. So, yeah, do you, do, you, do you see the sea as a sort of a... Is it like an animal to you? Do you have to be wary, like it's right. like no, a dog, it's, it's you know, not, can bite? It's or not it an opponent, be... is it? Right. But it's... You've got to be... You've got to know what it what it can do. It, it, it's I mean, I, were, I know once we had a a big metal f a flagstaff on the bow. It was solid metal, solid steel, and we hit just a wave and it we bounced a bit. America, that was bent double, and I mean it was a slim thing. You'd think the wave would just go round it, mm -hmm. but it didn't. It was flat as a, yeah. you know. And, Things like, you know, masts and things coming down. It, it just takes one wave, doesn't it? The power of the water yeah, is oh, yeah, very strong. Yeah. So you had a lot of respect for the sea. Oh, yeah, and yeah. You, 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 you never did silly things like sit on guardrails. You know, like, you see some idiot sitting on a guardrail and there was a, somebody had a say, and I heard somebody come out with it once and he said, there's only two people sit on guardrails. Uh, idiots and first trippers. You know, <laughs> you know... You only do it once and yeah. then you're in the water. <laughs> yeah, so apart from the nun thing and whistling then, you haven't really got any... Um, I've got some here, like, um, uh, we say touching wood on the uh, yeah. on, on the land. Yeah, it's well, good luck, but yeah, on a ship yeah. they say touching iron. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether you'd heard of that. Never heard of that okay. one. Okay. No. Um, I've always said touch wood. What about cutting your hair or cutting your nails at sea? Anything on that? 
No, I didn't know the explanation for that. I've forgotten it. Do you know what it is? Um, I think it's because the, if the hair or the nails go over the side, it's kind of like an offering to Neptune. It's effectively like you might be joining it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's uh, tempting yeah. the sea I did it. I did to take more of you, something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, some strange thing. Uh, having money when you go on a trip, uh, according to the, the superstitions things, a lot of fishermen wouldn't go out with any money because it was bad luck, yeah. because that was like you were rich. No. Another one about going to sea was wearing an earring and things like that, things with gold on, so that, that you could pay for your own funeral if you if you were if you didn't get killed or you know mm. go back. Mm. But that that wasn't in the merchant navy. You didn't have that in the merchant navy. Well, it, I think it's just a seaman's one now. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've got a lot of, quite a few seamen of PSD. I had a PSD once, mm. but I was in the Royal Navy then and it didn't go down very well. And the skipper said, Who do you hell do you think you are? Some sort of gypsy, get rid of that. <laughs> so, yeah. What about um, days of the week? I've heard something about not going to sea on a Friday. Does that sort of ring any bells? or? No, not going to sea on a Sunday just because it's a religious thing, but that was, that's what I've heard of. That, that was. Somebody I know, a Scotsman who was a fisherman, and oh, uh, I don't think you'll find many Scotsmen who will still w w will not go to sea on a Sunday, even though they aren't very religious, they still won't go to sea on a Sunday. Mm. So a lot of the of the things then, when you're in the Merchant Navy, really were to do with safety, uh, you know, being tidy and keeping safe, rather than superstitious. Uh, there were actual practical yeah, things. Yeah, I, so. I mean, if if, if you're if you did scruff it and things are, you, you know, you leave things lying around and lying around, if, if that, you have to pump things and a compartment needs pumping out mm. and there's all your dirty knickers and jeans and God knows what there, the pump gets blocked, you know, it's, it's, it's all to do with safety. You've got to have some sort of, sort of um, discipline, but it's mm. discipline yourself. Nobody else tells you, you know, nobody else has, should have to tell you, yeah. yeah. Mm. I mean, I've never had anybody come up to me and say, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, you do it, you do it automatically. What about sort of, I mean, the basic uh, good luck thing for travellers is a St Christopher, isn't it? Did a lot of uh, merchant navy men have St Christopher? Yeah, quite a few, yeah. yeah. yeah I am gone. Yeah. And did you feel that actually offered you some protection or was it just well, habit kind of thing? You did, I don't worry, because it can't do any harm wearing it, and if it does you any good, wear it anyway. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Insurance policy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of a lot of uh, merchant navy men or royal navy men would probably wear a Saint Christopher then. Yeah, yeah, right. The two very separate separate uh, jobs. Though. I mean, uh, uh, the merchant navy is nothing at all like the royal navy. So, mm -hmm. I mean, the captain calls you Jim, you know, you know and things like that. You never get that in the royal navy. Is it? Mm. Although I don't think it's as bad as it used to be. Mm. What was your position on the boat? What jo what jobs did you do on the boat? I did Ships, <laughs> signalling and Morse code and the signals and things was my job. Yeah. And and you learnt all that here at the Graham Training Sea School, did you? Yeah, quite. Uh, no, I learnt uh, semaphore, flag signalling. It's all finished now, of course. Even Morse is finished now. But I did learn that all here. Yeah. yeah. And, and then I went on to the boys. You know, the boys' navy, the, when I was 15, when the, you were called a boy seaman. Sea cadet? Uh, yeah. Boy seaman, you were called. And you, were, you, um, you did your training, and then you were uh, called an adult at 17 and a half. When you, well, the t until then, you were a boy seaman, and you, you didn't have a proper job on a ship, you, ship. Even on a ship, until you were 17, you were under training. Yeah. And in fact, as you said earlier, that you're, you're now living in the place that you went to school. This, oh, is, this, the is, this is the old Graham Sea Training. Oh, this is the old Graham Sea Training School, yeah. yeah. And so this was one of the classrooms. This, this, no, this, this was the kitchen. Right. This was, yes. And uh, the kitchen. No, this would be the dining room. The kitchen would have been to that flat on over the side. So did you ever imagine, I mean, when you were a lad, that you'd, you'd come back here, you'd travel the world and then come back here? <laughs> no, never. <laughs> 
And where have you been in the world? I know you've travelled a bit. Where? I think I've been around the world a few times. Yeah. Well, you've been pretty much every every country, have you? Just about. Yeah. Mm. Does that? How does that make you feel? Uh, sort of looking back now. Well, good. It was a good reason for going to see. It was one of the main reasons. Uh, I mean, I, I went in. I was in Japan in 1961, and they hadn't. And I was in the Royal Navy. Then. And they hadn't seen a, a British warship since the war, so they, you never know what reception you were going to get. As it was, it was very good. Mm. Mm. But it was very interesting. I went uh, I go to, um, I forget where it is now. Um, anyway, it was, a, it was along what we call a pilotage up the river, Bangkok. Mm. And all the surrendered Japanese fleet were there at the time. I don't know if they're still there now, but mm. they were just all the all rotting away at the river's out. Yeah. yeah, you see some good things when you travel. Do you have a favourite port or a favourite country? Favourite country would be Canada, I think. I wasn't that impressed with Aussie. And, uh, but Canada, yeah, I think I'd, that's really nice. What, what I, wouldn't, I wouldn't live anywhere else but Scarborough, but if, if I had to move somewhere else, it would have been Vancouver in Canada. British uh, Columbia. What did you like about it? What was the? Well, I don't know. I like the way the the very friendly. It was a very nice place, and the lakes, and even people who you didn't need to be really rich to have a lovely, you know, nice house by a lake and the trees, and just like it's on film, it's Canada. It's really good. Yeah. And on on your ship, presumably there were there were so were there seamen from different countries. Was it a multinational crew, or were you all? Uh, all British or no? I've sailed on mostly all British, but I have sailed when I, I sailed with supply ships for the Royal Navy, and they're they manned by merchantmen. But I've sailed with Maltese, a Maltese crew, and I've sailed with a whole crew of Chinese, Hong Kong Chinese. But they've they've obviously all gone back to Hong Kong now. They don't uh, employ uh, Hong Kong Chinese anymore. Mm. I think well, other ships would do, but not the Royal Navy supply ships. Though. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how they get on on, on some ships like like passenger landers. I'd like to know now because you get a man who does one job and he's Filipino. The next man's Chinese. You know, how do they get on for the for the for the language when in an emergency? I was on a Chinese cruise ship was called the Strom Ness and um, for some reason they all had to change their lifeboat stations so they all went on different lifeboats and so that the, 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 it was all you know mentioned to them which, which lifeboat you're now in and when when the alarm went off they all went to the proper lifeboat stations a month later do, do lifeboat stations again and they all go back to where they went before they, they're strange people we, we went to see, well, we picked the crew up in Hong Kong and we went to see and it was, I think it was two months before one, a quartermaster said to the captain, he said, Captain, do you realise, he said, we picked this crew up because the quartermasters always spoke English for the, for the orders, the quartermasters steal the ship and they had to know the, the, the orders in English and he's, he's, this, this quartermaster said, I can't speak to have this crew. They're Fu Chao, I am, I am Cantonese. And, and then it came out that nobody could speak to each other. We had to go back to Hong Kong, a different crew. Yeah. Were, were there different layers? I mean, did the, the sort of midshipmen talk to the stokers, as it were, or whatever? Was there quite a class oh, yeah, difference? Yeah, yeah, there is a, there is a mm. you know, there is an hierarchy, mm. but it, they all speak to each other, I don't know. Mm. Like that. Mm. And did but, you, yeah. but the Chinese didn't have to be sure that they were efficient in the job. What Hong Kong Chinese were, they were renowned for it. The, 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 somebody wanted the bosun's job instead of being an ordinary AB. He paid the agent, I want to be the bosun, there's a few quid. And that's how they get the promotion. <laughs> Always have been. And, and they can't say anything wrong with it. Mm. Did you always work for the same company on the same line? Yeah, line? just about the, Which the one was supply that? ships for the uh, Royal Navy. Which, which, yeah, right the because I had a job that um, entailed working with the Royal Navy, not being in it, but, but working with them, 
and I, I was uh, I used to do the semaphore and 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 the flag signals and and some of the radio signals and the VHF, which most or every merchant navy radio officer wasn't trained for, so they they they, would, they carried a, a signalman as well. Uh, I was a signalman. So as you say, the Morse code was uh, kind of that's what you that used what up until the end. You yeah. retired, yeah. <laughs> and, and uh, I'm glad I did retire because the the there was no such thing as a radio officer now. They're all gone. I think most of the radio officers retrained as electricians and got different jobs then, obviously, mm. because uh, I've got the license in the cupboard there. It's uh, called the GMDSS license. A ship can't go to sea without someone on board the ship having this license. Global Maritime Distress and Safety Services it's called. And, and but anybody could have that uh, license. I mean the galley boy could get one if he went to college and got one. Yeah. Did you ever come across any pirates? Did you ever get any pirate attacks? We've, I've done piracy patrols, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've done drug running patrols when I was in the island. Because yeah. obviously that's something now that's happening, isn't it? Oh, with, yeah. With pirates are taking but it isn't, ships. It, it isn't something new. People yeah. seem to think it's something new. That's gone on all the time. They didn't, you know, they, they didn't go to the extremes of kidnapping people, but it's been gone, going on all the time. The, those fast boats that they have are a sight to see. Mm. I mean, they've got about seven outboard motors on their back and, all, and they're just about f flying across the sea. <laughs> yeah. And I guess they go, they go for expensive cargoes, do they? So if you've got something very uh, valuable on board. I, think, I don't think they'd know what cargo you had, did they? I think they'd just, it's just an opportunity, I think. Mm. Yeah, opportunistic. What, what sort of cargoes were you mostly carrying in, in your days? Well, at food, most food, ammunition, um, what else? Uh, the strong nest carried everything. It was like a seagoing supermarket. Yeah. So, were, were you uh, a oil tanker? Obviously. Were you very attached to one particular ship? Did you? Yeah, the strong nest. Right, and that was your home for how long? I went. I was aboard it twice, and we did six month trips at the time. And I think I did about three trips on her, and uh, yes, that was my favourite ship. And and, it, and she, she never came home though. You, she used to, she was at the Far East most of the time, and then you flew home, and your relief flew out. So you never, the ship never really went on the strong mm. But obviously, in, in your career, you've worked on an awful lot of ships, and you. Uh, I don't know. I can't really, I don't, I've never thought of counting. <laughs> but I know the strong mess, uh, uh, I was at the first Gulf War and I was on a ship called the Sir Bedivere and I saw the strong mess again but it was it was called a different name and it, it, the Americans bought it, turned it into a warship and it was, it was quite good looking. Yeah. Mm. I forget what they, they bought, but the strong mess and the something else ness strongness and I can't think of the name but the the, the Americans bought both of them and Tarbot Ness and uh, they changed the names of something to do with stars and uh, yeah so I'm both in the Gulf War and, and they'd be pretty old by then. Do you, do, I mean do you feel a ship has a character then? Are they good ships yeah, or bad some ships? ships are good. Some ships have a real good feeling and some ships are not so good yeah. And I don't know why. I mean, it's only a piece of metal, but it, it does. It does. It does happen. Mm, I have a character then. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, well, I, I, know we have, I think we've exhausted the superstitions uh, <laughs> bit, haven't we? Do you want to? I mean, while we're doing this, do you want to say something about your involvement with the Maritime Heritage Centre? What what you've done and why you're involved with it? What yeah. Well, I knew I knew Lindy Rowley and. Uh, she just asked me to go to a meeting once, I forget when it was, three or four, four or five years ago, maybe. Is it that long? Yeah. And um, 
before you leave, you find yourself on the committee. I, I wasn't the only one. She uh, she was like the press gang. And it's very interesting, though. We've done some interesting things, and and it's a, it's a good thing to do as well. Otherwise, you know, Scarborough's not going to have any more ships. So, but, I mean, the boat building's gone. That, the last one of them went about two years ago, and that was only small very small boats they, they, they don't they haven't built any big ones for a long time mm. and, now, and now the fish is gone so that's gone and nobody nobody will keep any of the, these artifacts they'll all end up in a bin and then one day you won't even know what people are talking about mm. why why do you think it is important to save those things what well i think everybody should, should know what history was i mean otherwise it wouldn't there wouldn't be any point of having any history would there yeah, I think everybody should understand what the what the forefathers did. Or, yeah. yeah. And then what does it mean to you personally to be involved? Do you, do, do you enjoy sort of what you do with the maritime? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't think I'll ever get sick of it. It's, I quite enjoy it. Yeah. Excellent. Sometimes right. it's you know it's awkward to find certain times to do it in, like every Sunday is beginning to get a bit of a fourth. <laughs> but there we are. I said I'd do it, so I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right, Jim, well, that's lovely. Thank you very much for your time. Cheers. You're very welcome. That's it. Okay. So, um, I would, can you say your name and spell it for us and give us your date of birth? into that uh, place. My name's William Poshby. I was born July 1935. Okay Bill, what we're talking to you about today is uh, superstitions, good luck charms, that type of thing and we're doing it for the Scarborough Museum Trust and Scarborough Maritime Heritage. Yes. So what we'd like you to just tell us about is superstitions and probably why, uh, like example a PIG, why was it unlucky, um, that type of thing. Well, my, 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 my father, he was uh, very superstitious and he didn't mention, you had to say PIG and, uh, and long tails, you didn't say rats and uh, <coughs> Did you ever know why? No, never knew why, never knew why. It did bother me, I just, because all old men then, when I left school, they all were superstitious, you know. But I could never understand why. Mm. And some of them, and Good Friday, my dad wouldn't go to sea on a Good Friday. Why? I don't know. And, uh, <laughs> and there's one superstition, I must tell you this one. Uh, my Uncle Tom, uh, he had two young lads with him, and they all knew he was superstitious. And he was at the road for two o'clock in the morning to go to sea. And these two lads didn't want to go, really. Anyway, one of them was a uh, plumber's lad. And he let go of stern rope in the dark, and we could Tom pulled it in. Because that's an overhand knot. But to a uh, superstitious fisherman, that's a witch knot. So what he did, he let go of the rope and put here, put a witch knot in it. Uncle Tom pulled it in. Right, not going to do lads. <laughs> True that. <laughs> well, he, he had lots of superstitions. Oh. Yeah, did you have any superstitions yourself about no. going to sea? No. Or at sea? None at all. No. If it, if it was weather, I went to. If it wasn't weather, I didn't go. Cause I was brought up with superstition, I was fed up with it, you know. My granddad was very superstitious, and my dad, and, you know. So can you I tell us that. some of the superstition? Well, it's it, it mainly animals, you know, rats and uh, PIGs and uh, loads of silly little things. Bunnies. Bunny rabbit, oh, hi, bunnies. <laughs> What about other superstitions such as um, seeing the clergy or anything like that? Sorry. Oh, parson. Mm. Oh, I saw a parson. Uh, uh, they'd, they'd, go, they'd, they'd go back home. 
Yeah. Women? No. Nope. What about? Well, a lot, a lot of them wouldn't let women go on boats. Mm. Well, I do know that, yeah. Why would that be? I'd put, yeah. <coughs> uh, things like whistling? Oh, dirt whistle. <laughs> dirt whistle. God, when I first left school, I whistled. Uh, God, he never hit me, but he, he, I thought he was going to hit me, my dad, but he, he never did hit me in his life, but he looked at me. If looks could kill, God, I'm dead now. He says, there's enough wind. What's he trying to do? Make it bad weather, lad. Yeah. So you, d you didn't have any particular superstitions yourself? No. Like in preparation to go to sea? No. Or carrying any good luck charms? No, I wasn't. It didn't bother me. So. Colours? Oh, pardon? Colours. Colours. Oh, well, my favourite colours are blue. Yeah. <laughs> but no superstition with colours? No, no. The only, only superstition I had was this witch nut. Mm. That's funny, you know. Oh, if I saw a witch nut in there, up, oh, oh, I was uh, Tremble and take it out as quick as I can, could I, you know. But you're laughing about your Uncle Tom doing it, and you yeah. can do it yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other superstitions, or good luck charms, or sacrifices you made, or... No, not really. We, we, yeah. Even at home, not just to say what about at all. No, not, not really, no. I, I, I tell you, we once got a mine in that, and... Uh, it was 1960, 1964, the ship I had then was called Utilise. We just had a refit, and when we all, net was all torn, and we could see, when we got to go then, it was nearly hanging out. It was the mine, it was about eight foot long, like a torpedo, and uh, it looked brand new. You know, it was metal it was made of. Anyway, in the area where we were, we were two miles off Robin's Bay, and there's four or five Scarborough boats trawling round. And <clears throat> one of the skippers, I knew we'd been working on mines during the war, so I called him up, explained what it was, and he said, I'll tell you something, Pash. He says, uh, that mine has ten booby traps. Anyway, he says, the best thing you can do is to Get the hell out of it. Anyway, I got onto the radio to Leckenfield and explained to them, and they said, same, get off Scarborough, get two miles off and drop your anchor and get the hell out of it. Right. So, <clears throat> while this is all going on, we'd got the mine aboard. Lock and tackle never touched anything, got to the other side, lashed it up, and, and, and one of, what we learnt, one of the booby traps was vibration. Yeah. Anyway, and pressure of water, we cut it adrift, going down. And uh, anyway, it was Billy Scales who had been working on during the war. And he was talking to all the other skippers, but they all got out of our way. I'm left on my own, do you see? So we, we got net what was torn off, put another net on, and we shot away again. And uh, so, uh, when he said, told me one of them was vibration, it's vibration from engine going, you know. So I turned Frank to finish. And uh, I did as Leckenfield said, got two miles of Scarborough, dropped the anchor, and somebody ferried us ashore. Next morning, this officer, naval officer, two ratings, uh, we went out in Charlie Plummer's cobble. <coughs> And while we were going out there, this uh, officer said his brother was blown up during the war, taming this one of these mines, and the thing what blew him up, one of the booby traps was the heat of his hand going in. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I said, uh, uh, you won't be blowing uh, the boat up, will you? We might have to do, you know. Anyway, <clears throat> so I got in and I got, the, got it out. And uh, they took it up uh, on moors, and you could hear miles round when bang went. Yeah. So what? And if it'd been an English one, if it'd been an English mine, we would have got a bobber too. But we didn't, it was a German one. Anyway, 
Four weeks later, we got another mine. But this one was a round one, with spikes, but it was badly worn and you could see inside of it. Anyway, we brought it in and uh, I think we got about 400 quid for it, for damage it did, you know. So, right, so next morning we're going to go to sea again and we're going to dump it. You know, dump it in scars. Anyway, I think it was Ike Price that was outside of us that night, mowed up alongside I think he pinched it because he, he come in the following day with it and he claimed for, for 400 quid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh. So you weren't superstitious during that episode? No, then? no, no. You weren't saying your prayers or anything? No, 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 no. You no. we weren't looking for touching one? No. No. <laughs> Tell us any more superstitions or, or good luck charms, any that you know of even. Well, none of I what told you. Did Jimmy Sheila come up have a me? No, because he said he wasn't superstitious. No, no, well, I, I wasn't superstitious. Yeah. Just but I know your Uncle Tom definitely was. Oh, definitely. Tell us any more of his, because he had a lot. Oh, it did. Like uh, walking under ladders, so. Oh, he fits. There's all sorts. He was a funny fellow. He was. <laughs> I I used to uh, when he was in some uh, when I was at Graham C training school in summertime. We I used to get bus uh, to Robin Hood's Bay, climb down the cliff, and he picked me up in cobbles and we catching lobsters all night with him. <laughs> I, <clears throat> So we've had some like brush, upturned brush and things like that. No? Yeah, I've heard of that one, yeah. I've heard of that one, yeah. And uh, a cow. Huh? A cow. Yes, yeah, I've heard, heard, of, that heard one. of that one. But you've never come across any of them, so no. never used any of them. No. Didn't want somebody put a brush up your dad's clothes. No, tell them what that was. Uh, <clears throat> My dad uh, had a ship built at Newcastle from Trump. She, she sank off a of Whitby. And uh, the lad who was skipper of it, he was married to my sister Primrose. And uh, anyway, <coughs> my dad owned half of it, and Dutchman owned another half. When they went through for launch, uh, Tony East had put a, a, a brush up the ma mast. Well, the name of the ship was called Von Trump. Well, Von Trump was uh, fighting us. He was an admiral, weren't he? He was a Dutch admiral. Anyway, they signed the peace treaty. We weren't going to fight anymore. But when my dad saw broom up mast, he went really crackers. <laughs> Because that's a bad omen, is it, having a well, cat turn sweep broom? The seas. He said they were going to sweep the seas. Because when he come out of Von Trump, he's going to sweep the seas. Mm. So, and Tony East put... You and me, it, it aggravated my dad, not Tony East did. So your dad would probably say that was because Tony East did that, that mm. that boat was lost. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, your mum, did she have any superstitions? No. Like when your dad was going to sea or carrying yeah. any charms or... Yeah, I don't know. Hmm. Do you want to stop to breathe a bit? Yeah. Are you alright? Yeah, I'm okay. Stop there for a minute. Okay. Okay. Last Monday I was in, sent to Catherine's hospice and uh, there's some Whitby ladies in there and uh, some Scarborough chaps. Anyway, <coughs> I had one of these Whitby ladies say, uh, there are Algerinos over there. So I pricked my ears up. I says, I, <coughs> I says, I said, I bet you don't know why they call us Algerinos. And they didn't. Do you know why? Okay. Well, do you know why? Well, years and years ago, this is true. Years, years ago, when ships was under sail, there was a ship foundering off Robin Hood's Bay. And uh, <coughs> a man on the cliff, on horseback, galloped to Scarborough, 
to tell the lifeboat crew, rowing the lifeboat then. And I think my great granddad was a crew member. I'm not 100% but I think he was. Anyway, they got there, saved them, towed her back to Scarborough. Well, with the lifeboat, they play now because it was on their territory, they should have had it. So they nicknamed us Algerinos because the name of the ship was called Algerino. <laughs> and these Whitby women didn't know about that. Mm. <laughs> right, um, could you just uh, tell us your name and your date of birth, please? Alan Roberts, yeah, um, 7th of June and 1941. Thank you, Alan. Um, the purpose of this uh, interview is to talk about superstitions uh, that fishermen and mariners had, superstitions about keeping safe at sea or superstitions that might lead you into danger, and also to talk about superstitions that would help you get a good catch or not. So would you like to just start by telling us any superstitions that you know of or that you might have uh, followed in the past? Well, because I spent a lot of time with my grandparents, living with them, who were from a, an older generation, I think they were more superstitious than most. And... Uh, you, you you became aware that you, the stuff you hadn't got to talk about, <laughs> and uh, and you would avoid them, and and at times you could nearly blackmail blackmail them with it, you know. Um, I th the worst one at home was was of course the pig, you know. Um, it had to be a, a grunter or a gruff or a curly tail, you know, and. Even the, the, they had you sort of instilled at school. We're doing the alphabet, you know, and it was A for apple and B, and, and it got to P for pig, you know, and, and I thought, oh, I, I don't say this, you know. And I can remember going home, and uh, so we've been doing alphabet today, Grant. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, when they got to P, says it was... It was one of them grunters, but I didn't say it, I didn't say it, yeah. Yeah, so you, there was times, if you wanted some, you know, you say, well, if I'm not going to have a good ear, well, I'm going to say it, you know, give him a, <laughs> give him a good ear, yeah. Yeah, um, and I ain't got a very good memory, so I won't say it, but same as uh, rabbits, there were bunnies, you know, just, call him a bunny and of course rats was long tails uh, you couldn't cross knives on the table there was faces pulled and and whatever um, and you couldn't put shoes on the table um, you know and the temptation was when you got a new pair you know if you come down with a new pair you'd be wanting to show them off oh, if you put them near, near the table you, you sort of Thought it was all right when they were clean and new, but there was there was hell on. You couldn't put shoes on the table. No whistling. We couldn't whistle. We used to go out and whistle, and uh, you couldn't cross on the stairs for some reason. I don't know. I don't know what the reason for that is. And they were they were sort of everyday things in the house that that you were aware of. What what, uh, what would happen if you had mentioned the PIG? Did anybody ever tell you oh, what, what it would do? Oh, they going to a soak, you know. Oh, that's done it. Oh, throw his, air in, his hands in air and... Uh, I think that generation were were more aware of these superstitions, you know. I mean, people don't bother now. Uh, you've perhaps better educated as well um, than they were, you know. I mean, he was born in 1885, so they didn't get much of it. And, and why do you think, do you know why the PIG was bad luck? What, what I have no idea. Right? I have no idea, really. It was just just one of those strange things. Would um, he not go to sea if he, if somebody had said that then? Or? Oh, he would go, but uh, I don't know. 
I really don't know the reason why why they have this uh, this superstition. You know, um, you you get some people that wouldn't have a pork pie aboard and, and like Nervo. You know, you don't take a pork pie aboard of his boat; it'd be hell on it, fire you out of it. You know, um, and you couldn't give a knife away. You, if, if you give somebody a knife, you, you have to take some a penny. It was only a penny or an eight penny. They, I think the the feeling was that if if you didn't buy, you, you were cutting the friendship, uh, cutting your your ties. Um, and I think also some of the things came down from superstition rather than. Bad luck. My gran couldn't sew on a Sunday in the house. Couldn't use the scissors even. Um, uh, but I think that came from when you shouldn't work on a Sunday, you know, rather than it being it was more bad form than than bad luck. I think that's that's my slant on it. You know, you know, the Sabbath was sort of more uh, revered, wasn't it, in the past? You know. Um, I mean, finally hung back on going to sea on a Sunday. I can't remember it, but a, a lot later than did it at Scarborough, we were heathens compared to them, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, I've heard tell that it, if Scarborough cobbles went down under brig on a Sunday, they were firing stones at them off cliff top. You know, they they, uh, they, they weren't uh, they weren't keen on it and. I suppose that's about it from from the household uh, part of it. But you know, if you were turning over from uh, from potting to winter fishing, you, they wouldn't start it on a Friday. You know, uh, it, they'd have to wait till Saturday or Sunday. Or, but they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't start on a Friday. Um, some of them wouldn't even lunch. Well, you shouldn't launch a boat on a Friday anyway, but sometimes if they've been laid up for a while painting, they would be aware of the significance of Friday, I think. Yeah. Do you think that had religious connections again, the Friday? Well, it, I suppose the crucified one, was it Good Friday on it? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's maybe, uh, maybe goes back, back to that. You know, in superstition, they had to send the Navy to Scarborough, didn't they, over superstition? Um, for the herrings, because the uh, the Scotchman came down, and th they were very superstitious, um, God fearing perhaps rather than superstitious. They wouldn't go to sea on a Sunday. The Cornishman came; they they didn't give a two oats. They went to sea, and and they ended up scrapping at one stage. I understand that that the Navy had to have a presence to to uh, keep them quiet, but. Um, that just tells you here whether it's right or not. Um, I don't know. I don't know. No. Um, and then there's the ones that you wear, isn't it? You know, nuns, you shouldn't, if you don't want to see a nun there, unlucky. Like, we don't see any, many nuns in Scarborough anyway, do we? It must be awful if you lived in Whitby, yeah. You'd never get to see some days. Um, and carry, carrying a baby's call, you wouldn't drown. Yeah? And and I understand that they would change hands in the past for up to thirty pound a go. Um, they believe that you wouldn't drown if you had one in you. Strange, isn't it? Did you ever carry anything with you? Did you ever have any sort of Saint Christopher or any lucky things with you? No. You make your own luck, really, don't you? in life and everything just uh, make the best of the circumstances even so if they're wrong you wouldn't call yourself superstitious then really you'd, you're more practical no. than mm. no. no I don't think so I don't think so but you presumably you met quite a few fishermen and mariners that were very superstitious oh then. yeah the family especially the old ones mm. the old ones yeah 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 and did you ever see any bad luck sort of result, uh, you know, because of one of these omens, or...? No, I don't think so. No. You 
sometimes, you know. He's a lucky bugger, him, so I think. But uh, I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think luck plays much of a part in uh, in life, myself. Because so far we've sort of talked about um, charms and things or, or bad luck, but obviously there's a whole raft of things that might bring you good luck. Um, some fishermen talk about putting a drop of whiskey in the sea or throwing a coin in. Oh yeah, and you hear tales of these old men more than more than here. You know, if they couldn't catch out, they were going to buy it, didn't they? And chuck coins in, but uh, I've never seen it happen. No, I've never had that much coin to chuck in myself, mate. Yeah. Yeah. And squint eyed people and all, you know. They reckon somebody, some people don't like to see squint eyed people. They, they consider them uh, to be unlucky. I think you're just unlucky if you have a squint, myself, like it. Must be off, mustn't it? Uh, and again, not to do with a C, really, but one that Lynn up with she would never give a purse a gift of a purse without a, a coin in it sort of job uh, so they always had they would always have some money uh, I suppose was as she uh, explained it and best one I like uh, nude women calm the sea you know well I could never get them to go but um, they reckon that's why the figureheads often had bare breasted women wasn't it? it was part of the uh, Part of the uh, bad luck thing, and the other one that I've heard of is is hatch boards off off the hatch. You know, you you shouldn't turn them upside down, or or lay them across. You know, lay them across the hatch. You know, it was supposed to supposed to look like a a coffin with a with a lid laid there. People, some took exception to it. It all depends on, on your outlook, doesn't it? This look mm -hmm. business, mm -hmm. I think myself anyway. Yeah, yeah. Do you think the superstitions um, are, are are a way of sort of uh, the fishermen trying to control the environment when they're, they're working in a very uncontrolled environment? You think? I mean, the sea is a, an unknown animal, isn't it? Hmm, uh, and more so in the past, wasn't it? It, it was the, a much more dangerous job than it is now. Poor beggars were getting lost on a, a daily basis, weren't they? Um, happily, it's much safer at sea today. I, I think uh, people were more aware of the mortality in in the past and sort of fragile environment that they were they were living in, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah, I think there's some of that in it. With with your, as you say, then your relatives, your your, your family, um, did they observe these superstitions all their lives? Really, did they carry them on? Oh, the old ones did. Yeah, yeah, the old ones did. As you got to my mother and um, my father, they they weren't bothered really. I think my mother would carry on sometimes just for sake of it. You know, but, I mean. She'd like to have a good row about anything, um, I suppose. Sort of became a habit rather than... Yeah, um, that's right, yeah. Right. Yeah, Because yeah. we've heard the one about not washing the clothes when they go to sea. Yeah, I've that... heard, I've heard that one. I, I can't say that that figured anywhere. Uh, but, of course, we were only cobblemen. You only went for the days, sort of thing. I think it was more a whole thing, that one, you know, where the... Weather away for two or three weeks at a time. Did they have anything about sort of colours or numbers, lucky or unlucky colours or numbers? Green. Green at home. She, my grand wouldn't, you couldn't, what's it, you couldn't wear it. She wouldn't buy you anything green. And if she saw you in green, she would, you know, well, that colour on for her, I'm sure. That's no good. And, uh, but uh, I suppose as well. You subconsciously knew that and didn't didn't upset them, didn't upset the apple cart. Uh. Did she ever explain why again? What no. the green? Why it was unlucky? No, I don't, I've no idea. <laughs>
Uh, en die ze gewoon nog wel meer plassen, maar nou, dan, uh, ook dijks, you know, when, when Blackthorn Blossom come out, you know, you don't fetch none of that in the house, it's, uh, it's no good. I, again, the significance of it is, is lost on me. Yeah. But that may be maybe sort of pagan or witchy or something perhaps like that, so. maybe. Perhaps so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Did, did they ever talk about sort of that kind of, I mean, witches is something, the f extreme end of superstition. Yeah. Did they ever kind of say, say that that woman might be a witch or anything? Was there a feeling that, that the witches might actually exist? No, no, I don't think so. I can't ever remember uh, anything like that at all. No. The, I suppose in my case... My granddad, he was teetotal, didn't go in the pubs and he he didn't go to church. But I never ever heard him swear anything. He he, he was a gentle sort of a bloke, I think. He, uh, uh, he probably uh, thought deeper about life than going out and whatever, yeah. My gran, my mum described him as parsimonious. What does that mean? No. <laughs> Got us there. <laughs> no, I don't know. We'll look it up when we get back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so generally, as you say, you, you wouldn't describe yourself as superstitious, no. but the previous generations have been, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, things that people might do now, like just throw a bit of salt over their shoulder, aren't they? It's yeah, they don't touching wood. Just throw salt and that. Yeah. Or touch wood. Everybody used to do that, didn't they? It was, uh, um, again, yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't understand, I don't know the significance. I do believe that a lot of the superstitious parts of life went out because we were better educated. You didn't understand uh, things as, uh, as well as you do now. Even the everyday science of life, you understand it better now, don't you, than, than you used to do. It was all um, a bit of a mystery to them, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Perhaps it was a mystery that um, they were feared of. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to just say a little bit about your sort of maritime experience, what you've done in your life with the sea and maritime things? It might be interesting. <laughs> Just briefly. Uh, yeah. Oh, briefly. Well, because I spent most of my most of my childhood with my grandparents, I went to stay for a fortnight, and I stayed uh, fourteen. I stayed seven years in the end. They had to marry me off to get rid of me. Uh, uh, and he had a big influence on me, and all I ever wanted to do was be like my granddad and have a boat. Unfortunately, it never worked out that way because uh, I was told I couldn't go to sea and you don't be going out there in the cold and wet and swimming about and whatever. And uh, I got a job in a shoe shop of all places, mending shoes. Wages was, you couldn't live on the wages, so I got a job as a postman. So I ended up getting up at all hours and going out in the wind and the cold and the rain. <laughs> so anyway, I got a bobber tool together and I packed it in when I was, uh, oh, cranky, 34 and, and bought a boat and stayed, uh, stayed fishing until I finished, um, which is all I wanted to do. Yeah, uh, Best job in the world, best job in the world. It's a shame that it's all gone, you know, and really... I, I couldn't wait to get up and get down and, and go and do it. Smashing job, yeah. Was that inshore fishing? Or yeah, or yeah, just in cobbles. Mm. Just in cobbles, yeah. Yeah. So, in a, in a way, I'm lucky in that at the end of my working life, I, I did what I wanted to do when I was a, a school band, so, yeah. Good, okay, thank you very much. And that's that.
So, uh, could you just state your name and your date of birth for the record, please? Anthony East, which is A N T H O N Y E A S T. Um, I'm 73, I was born 1938, 24th of March. I was born in Hull, which uh, is my sort of birth city, but Scarborough's my little love town. And uh, that's it, I've been a fisherman a great deal of my life, and I've also been in the Merchant Navy. I've travelled quite well around the world, and um, enjoyed what I've seen. And now it's a, a sort of a little bit of a give back to it. Great. Okay, well the project, as you know, Tony, is basically about maritime superstitions. Uh, superstitions about keeping yourself safe at sea, so avoiding bad omens, and also getting a good catch. So could you tell me what you know about um, sort of old superstitions about uh, that would uh, endanger you if you saw something or heard something before you went to sea? Um, thinking back to um, my mother, particularly, um, you know, she looked after my father, and then, because when I came along, it was destiny to be a fisherman, and it wasn't until I was into my teens and at school that then father said he didn't want me to be a fisherman, it wasn't the thing. I think he possibly had a fear, he'd been through the war, he'd been fishing in the Arctic, he'd seen quite a lot of um, unsettling things and that was possibly his way but I was adamant that I went to sea so instead of being a fisherman he sent me off into the Merchant Navy and that was when I realised what my mother used to do for him and the funny little things that I'd never really noticed because it was part of natural life you know, she never washed on the day he went away. She never went to the front door to see him off. Um, that would be done uh, somewhere in the house, but certainly not at any door. And of course, we had my mother's mother living with us, who was very, very superstitious. But she never spoke about these things. And it wasn't until much, much later, when I was at sea myself, that I realised how many seamen were superstitious. Um, the master on this cargo ship I was on, um, he didn't like green. He didn't like sailing on Friday. Um, purely, I think, that some of that comes in with religion. Uh, Good Friday was a nominal day in the most religious people's mind. And that was maybe the thing. The colour of green, I don't know why, it never came out until much, much later in my life. Um, we, we had green undercoat for some of the steelwork. It was immediately dispatched ashore and this stuff come back which was labelled silver chromate. Another quite unusual thing. And the more he um, came out with things, I did regard him as highly superstitious and quite a one-off guy. Um, on, a, on a ship the master is the loneliest man on the ship. Again maybe this is where they come with these things and um, again the whistling came in if you would you could sing all you wanted but anybody that whistled was frowned on and in fact um, I was in one ship and I was on watch, I was third hand and one of the deckies had come up, mugs of tea in his hand whistling through his teeth, not loudly, not other than sort of and the skipper lit literally leapt on him and uh, he was told there and then that when we got back into Hull he could pack his gear and go ashore you know, he, he'd got literally the sack mm. for whistling and a couple of times I asked people why, and so, oh, you don't believe that rubbish. And then on the other hand, you got the, oh, you're, you're whistling for the wind. And I began then to think about some of the other things. And the guys that used to come away with their kit back, and out would come some of the most outlandish 
things that the children had put in his bag. And it was a, another thing that, that came up that um, once a fisherman's bag was packed, nothing was ever taken out until he got to sea. And of course, the children in the family knew this. And some of the most wonderful little things and drawings and pictures and bits of what we couldn't make sense of, but he could, came out of the bag. And it was surprising then that I found out a lot of fishermen and seamen, they weren't good readers. Hence the comics. There was Dandies, there was Beano's, there was these things. And I thought, well, it's not childish. But again, um, you could see it in them. They were happy with the object, whether it was because it was from home or because it was the kids that had done it. I think that was maybe a, a consoling thought that somebody cared for them. And we did have a cook with us who, a um, few trips previous to us, they'd had to put him ashore, he'd sort of gone a little bit funny. And he used to crow on this wonderful letter he had. And it, it was to prove that he wasn't mad. And in a way, he, he carried it with him. It was his talisman. It was um, something to say that um, that he was he was sane, and it was all of us that was crackers. But it's you can always come along on every ship. There's always something. Oh, don't go there. Or don't do this. Um, we did have somebody die with us once, and he, um, we, we put him in a bunk, and it was in a six-man berth. And everybody moved into other berths. Mm. Nobody would say, uh, well, I'll stay in there. Mm. And about myself, I've always been a believer that it isn't dead people that hurt you. It's the live people. And I sometimes wonder, you know, why, why come up with that one, Tony? You know, what made you think that? But that was how it was. And when I spoke to my father about it, uh, he'd been in a ship. And um, they picked up all the crew of a ship that had run ashore in Greenland, unfortunately all dead. And um, I think they picked either 11, 10 or 11 bodies up. And they put them in the ship's lifeboat, which was a, you know, there, it, there was no chance that they would go rotten or anything. And the only unfortunate part of that was that where the ship's log was based, where you went to check the speed or how many miles you'd done, was on the boat deck and you had to walk past this lifeboat. And the excuses and things that came out that somebody wouldn't go that way, oh I won't go that way now, um, uh, can you go and do it for me? It was passed from book to book, hand to hand, um, a superstition that they don't like death or dead bodies aboard of a ship. And what happened, they, they run into Scotland, which was the nearest port from Greenland, um, and put the bodies ashore, then carried on to Hull. Um, again, you know, this come up in my mind always the time that, you know, in death, the harm's gone. And um, I still think like that now. Um, you know, when I was in the lighthouse many years ago, um, we found somebody in the harbour and there was a band of lookers on but they wouldn't come any nearer and of course we had to get him out of the harbour and um, somebody said hasn't that bothered you? I said no, I said he's not going to hurt us so maybe that's my little superstition Hang on for that. So, um, yeah so um, with these bad omens then um, did, did, uh, were there ones that you used to practice regularly? Were there things that you wouldn't say or wouldn't do or wouldn't carry with you uh, to see? No, I think I was um, just an, in, well, an innocent or an interested bystander. Um, I mean, I did learn very quickly that um, I didn't whistle. 
because I always wish I would have tuned in any case, but that was one thing. And a lot of people surprise me when they say, you know, about fishermen and trawlers. Um, you know, oh, look at that dirty, scruffy trawler, the rest of it. But in a way, when you went to live with this, that was when you appreciated um, the care that was taken on a ship. Everything worked perfectly. Everything was made to work perfectly. And nobody sort of pull pulled anything. Um, you know, I never saw anybody on a trawler kill a bird. Mm -hmm. I did on the, in the Merchant Navy. There, there was somebody who did that with a bow and arrow. And he, he said, I didn't do it deliberately. I was just firing to see how far this arrow would go. And unfortunately, he did this bird. And it was, but... Did it bring him bad luck after that? Or? Um, not that we notice. We, mm. It's what some people term bad luck is not always as bad as it sounds. Um, I, I can remember one time that uh, there was quite a number of the crew when I was in the merchant service went on the Ouija board, which to me was a little bit unsettling. And to a lot of them, oh no, you don't mess about with that. You know, it's the spirits. But they, they persevered with it. Um, and I never saw any sort of bad luck come out of it. Uh, the, the only any incident ever of any sort of bad luck um, was we were bound from Japan to Australia and we got a mayday for a coaster, which was uh, actually from the Philippines. And um, they'd broken down and could they come and assist? So we turned back and it was evening time, time we got there when we were in the Bass Straits, which is quite a well-known bad area for weather. And we got there and the only thing that was to us that was really bad luck, that was we were like ship. We were high out the water, no cargo. And we were rolling in the swell heavy and we tried three attempts at putting a tow rope aboard and um, in the end they said uh, we'll, no we'll wait until light in the morning and of course we got everything ready during the night and I, I was on watch with the mate four o'clock and as daylight come up we headed in to attempt to put the tow rope on him and no more said he, he just turned on its side and sunk and then, of course, we decided that we would, the captain did, that we would launch our lifeboat and pick up as many as we could. And with the heavy weather was, um, we got the lifeboat lowered away, lowered away down to the water, rolled heavily, smashed the lifeboat, which fell off its davit things and went in the prop, which uh, that was, to me, that was bad luck. Mm. But you didn't put that down to any sort of superstitious omens or anything that had happened? Not, or... not really, but it, it seemed right from the first time we got the May Day that everything literally wasn't kosher, as I would say. Mm -hmm. You know, this went wrong, that went wrong, the other went wrong. And, of course, then we had to attempt to pick up, I think we picked up 13 men, and we were using long ladders down to the water. You've got to respect that we were 36 feet above the water and the old bosun was hanging on with one arm through the ladder grabbing somebody. We were lowering a rope down and they'd put a loop around him and pull him up manually and eventually um, we got, I think we got 11 and then their little lifeboat which had broken adrift, it had took all the rails off it and everything and there was two men in that, and they couldn't help us out. And I'd gone down and put a rope around one of the guys and pulled him up. And, we were, and I'd shouted up to the mate, I said, there's somebody's briefcase here. And he's more or less, oh, blame him for leaving. He says, I think we've got enough. And he said, um, I'll lower you an axe down, just put an axe through the bottom of the boat. And I thought, quite a strange thing. And he did tell me later that he said, if we'd have left it floating, we could have gone back into land to land these survivors. Somebody could have come along and said, oh, there's a boat adrift. 
where's the ship, where's this? So he said the best thing is always, he said even in wartime, that if there was a boat floating about, you put your axe through the bottom. There's a danger to shipping, isn't and, it? Mm -hmm. You know, and to me that was not so much bad luck, hard luck, whatever good luck, I thought that was good seamanship. And I've always thought that, that most of the things that happen on ships, um, to me are not bad luck, bad luck, mm. this, the other luck. I think bad seamanship, yes. Like leaving a hatch cover upside down was supposed oh, to be yeah, unlucky, yeah, but yeah, practically the, that's a danger but, as know, well, is it? You know, when, when I first went, I was 16 years of age, and they meant, right, you put these wedges in this way around, that way around. And, I, you know, I thought, is this one of them funny things? And then eventually I learned that if you put the, hat, the wedges and things in on the right way, if you're st steaming into heavy sea, the sea's pushing them further in for you. Which, um, there's lots and lots mm -hmm. of silly little daft things that come up. And you can't keep disregarding them all the time. Mm -hmm. um, it was just one of those things. And it, when you were on watch, you know, back in them days, there was an officer and three men on watch. So you would have one man on the wheel, one man would be at lookout, the other would be what we call the farmer. And I used to say, what do you do when you're there? He said, oh, I don't wander around the ship in the dark. And I thought, well, why? What would be the worry? It, it was, to me, I used to love lookout because it was dark. There was no lights around. You could see the heavens. Mm. You could see the northern lights, the southern lights. And so, oh, you don't want to be seeing them. And I think, oh, no, not one of these other crackpots. I'd got to the point of so all these things, things that can be explained, are to me are legitimate. Mm. But if you can't explain it, don't frighten some poor sod else to death, mm. which is what does happen. So you're, you're basically kind of saying then a lot of your comrades were far more superstitious than you were. You, yeah, they, they... It, it's, it's, it's amazed me. But um, again, I respected what they thought. Mm. And it wasn't until I went fishing myself that I realised what my mother and my grandmother had done. You know, they, they didn't wash his clothes. That was, uh, you're washing him away. Um, you know, that sort of thing. But there must be people who went fishing that weren't from families of fishermen. I mean, even in, even in our house, the floor was never a floor, it was a deck. Um, it, it was like living on a ship, but we were anchored permanently. And that was how it was. And when I came into inshore fishing at Scarborough, I then realised how many inshore fishermen were highly superstitious. You know, you saw a cat as this, the other thing. Uh, and in fact, it come a joke. And um, I do respect theirs. You know, I'd, I call them things with long ears, for, you know, furry things. Um, and I will spell the other words for them because that's what the children here are taught. Mm -hmm. And it's, it comes normal to me. And when you really go into other little bits and pieces of what you do, oh, you don't do that, you do it this way, you do it that way. A lot of the things that you do in life do come from that sort of thing. And, um, you know, when, when I first learnt about call, you know, the little piece of skin that goes across a baby's face. I thought, what a fascinating subject. Until then I heard how much some of the fishermen would pay for one. And I think back in the late 40s, early 50s, I heard that one had gone in one of the streets near where we lived, and it had gone for something like 60 to 70 pound. That was a lot of money then. I mean, when I first went to say I was only at six pound 18 shillings a month. That was unlucky, <laughs> but again, um, it, and again it gets back to fishermen and the things they do right to make good luck. Uh, there is nothing more superstitious than a skipper who starts on his sea gear, the, the trawl, the net, the boat. This has to be right, that has to be right. And I have sailed in one ship where we all had a two foot stick each. That's a measuring tool on a trawler. And of course, when you were running off, you would be making the trawl up. 
and he would have his head out the window. Oh, measure from there to there, measure from here to there. What did you get? What did you get? And I would imagine this added literally a day more to our work of getting the net ready. And he'd come to the fact that if he was happy with the net, he would then know that he would, he would catch fish. Mm. And um, I said to one of the skipper, um, Charlie O'Neill, who was a, quite a prominent hull skipper, in fact he was one of the first skippers ever to earn his company a million pound. And I'm talking about back in the days when eight, nine, ten thousand pound for a three week trip was big money. And he was the most eccentric man I ever knew. And we'd, we'd set off and we'd got sort of just ready to come round the North Cape of Norway and make our mind up whether we went to Bear Island, which was further north, or round under the Barents Sea, which was to the eastward. And he stopped the ship and he sort of leant on the veranda rail, mulling his thoughts of her. And I was going to make it, he's just making his mind up whether we go that way or the other way. And I could see literally, you could see his brain ticking as to say, well, they're getting that there and I'm getting that here. Because the unfortunate part of most fishermen, skippers, are liars. They can lie and smile. They do make good politicians, I believe. And that was what he was doing. And we were two hours while he made his mind up. Because again, it comes back, and again, not to superstition, that in Hull, there was 180 ships, so hence 180 skippers, mm. plus another 180 to 200 skippers waiting to get a job. And the thing was from the gaffers that you go out there, you catch fish or else. So that brings in quite an off layer of the superstition thing. Mm. Well, so to, 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 as you say then, to, to ensure a good catch, were there things like, did you know, they took about making offerings, tip a bit of whiskey in the sea or throw a coin in or put salt on the nets? Did you see any of those? Yeah. Sort of oh, things? yeah. When, when we came out the lock pits, um, if you were upon the whale back, it was prominent that the lads would be, you know, still in the suits, the rest of it, they hadn't got changed, and they'd rake in and be a handful of change and throw it just in that little area as you came out the lock pit of St Andrew's Dock. That was quite a common... They were buying next trips good luck mm -hmm. and because and then there was always the always the skeptic oh that never worked with me and it's funny enough that we, we still you know got the news sparks would come down with a bit of a news sheet we got the horses for the gamblers we played dominoes and yet i'd sail in one ship that oh you couldn't have any of them them's god's instruments and the devil's instruments. It, it's the religious side comes in quite a lot mm. on a lot of superstitions. Mm. And again, you know, I've maybe I've got one there. I've got my gold cross. I lost it that many times. I had it tattooed on my chest. Um, didn't do quite all I expected. But um, again, I'm here. I've I've sailed a few million miles. I would imagine. And uh, I haven't had any real hairy escape. One or two, because uh, somebody did say to me, are you ever frightened going to sea? And I said, I wouldn't go if I was frightened. And I said, it's surprising how many atheists I met that when weather was bad, they were the first on the knees. Um, and again, it, I think it's wrong in a way to bring religion into what people think, you know, if you want to do that, I do that, or, or jump up and down and spin round. It's it's your prerogative. But when you read through uh, some of the things that some people have said, I mean, Hull's been one of the tragic towns of losses of fishermen. A um, friend of mine went through it, and some, I think the local paper had said that five or 6,000 men were lost out of Hull over the years. And he, he dug deeper and deeper and he found a figure nearer to 10,000 men. And you think of 10,000 fishermen and the families and mothers. Uh, some of the superstitions of families are, are beyond belief. What sort of things? Um, I know one lady, she would never empty the ashtrays. 
if he'd sat at home and smoked, the ashtray would be there until he came home, he would, she would then empty them. But she would never do, you know, mm. he would sit and have his foot smoke and the rest of it. Um, things like that. And, um, I mean, but again, when they say about, you know, sea gear and the rest of it, it was a well-known fact uh, in the years before the war that when the fishermen went off to sea, it wasn't unusual for his wife or his mother to go and pawn his suit. And she would go and get the money for the suit, and as soon as they knew that they were on the way home, she would go and get the suit redeemed. Um, such was financial, but um, it's strange, how strange some of them are. Uh, you know, but there's some of them, you know, I used to think, well, why, why, should, why would he do that? Why would he do the other? And it gets you thinking of superstitions. And uh, as far as the drinking ever went, I mean, trollmen have all been well known for the drinking. And it, it, it was quite a common fact that some of them would. They'd get a tot of rum, and that, that's for next trip. Mm -hmm. You know, spill it on the deck. Mm -hmm. And if, they, if that was buying good luck, um, that, that must have been one of the funny ones, I thought. But I still think that fishing is, it's, it's the last of the big hunters thing. And unfortunately, uh, governments, economy and other things have now rubbed it all away. So I can't think, um, if I had to pick a superstition, it would be not to talk or listen to a politician. <laughs> That would be my favourite one. You know, I could I can talk to anybody and listen to anybody, but if I had, that would be my superstition. Right. What do you think that would bring you bad luck if you did oh, talk I'm, to them? Oh, almost certain of it. I mean, any mention of a politician near fishermen, and you, you can see things go wrong. You know, that to me is if they say, well, think, think of a sensible superstition, and that would be mine. Mm. But. I still respect all the other people for, you know, theirs. Mm. And as long as it doesn't harm me. I mean, taking in the, the green thing, um, when I, you know, say with Colin Jenkinson, all the boats are green. So that doesn't mean anything in their family. But again... Um, About numbers, any lucky numbers or unlucky I mean, numbers? Well, yeah, Colin has to have a seven in it. Um, and I mean, his last ship, ship was, you know, the big one was SH-77. But there was always, and I'd, I did ask him about that one day, and it goes back to his first boat, which I think was, she was the old Courage, and he called her Margaret and William. And I think the number combined made seven. And it was a good look, because he was, you know, I mean, a lot of players, oh, he, he, you know, if he fell in the dock, he would come out smelling of roses and fish, but he he applied everything, where I think, correctly. We always had good gear, we always ate well, the boat was always right, and maybe one of his peculiarities, which I always thought was good, was that we never came in harbour scruffy. If we were coming in, it was the end of the week, the boat would be washed out at sea, the net would be stowed away. The gear list, what we had, we knew what we wanted, mm. and he was always well known for having a, a vast amount of sea gear. Mm. And as he said to me one day, if you haven't got sea gear, you can't go fishing. And to me, that to me, that's a real sensible, good luck charm. What about knots in ropes? I'd heard somebody talk about if you found a knot in a rope, that that that, that maybe, you know, a, um, a, a witch or someone well, had put the knot in there. Being a subject that I've loved right from when my granny first taught me, I know I think I was about six or seven years of age, um, she did teach me to net men. She made net. So when I look at that, when people, you know, like you've just told me, and I've, I've heard it from a few other people, um, what, when you make a net, are you doing? A net is made out of knots. Uh, granted it's a sheep bend, it's a sheep bend, it's a sheep bend, but um, 
But when you think of the men going off to sea and the women at home, they looked after the children, they kept the house clean, but they were all short of money. And one way of making money, it wasn't a lot of money, was that they braided net. They would dash down the fish dock with an old pram, fill it full of balls of twine, come home, and in most houses on Hesel Road in Hull, there would be hooks in the wall where you could hang and braid. And it was braided to size. You had what was called a spool, a piece of wood, that was the size you had to do it. And generally, the old husband, who would be an old fisherman, no doubt, would sit and fill needles. And of course, we sat and filled needles as grandkids. That was a thing we did. You learned how to fill a needle. And then that was taken off. I don't think they got paid a lot of money. And when they say about women being on ships, that's always considered an unlucky thing. Um, I've never found it so, but a lot of people think that way. And when you think of knots being either lucky or unlucky, some of the fastest people who make and do net are women. Um, there was a lady that used to work for Boston Deep Sea and you couldn't see her hands move. It was that quick. And I think, well, if it's superstitious for women to go on a ship, what about the superstition of the a women's handle a trawl? And again, that comes into the women thing, you know. Um, I have met blokes that, um, oh, the missus was on uh, the usual term of the monthly, so the daughter washed me back. I thought, that was a strange one. Um, that, I did have a Muslim friend, and that's how their lifestyle is. That if a woman's on that part of her life, she doesn't do anything in the house. She doesn't, the husband doesn't want her to touch anything, to cook anything, or to wash anything until it's over. Um, possibly the Muslim way of life. They do treat women with a little bit different to where we do. But um, for a normal fisherman, I thought, no, that's one, that's personal. Mm. And it comes a little bit sometimes funny that when you try to ask somebody, they, they shut down. It's very, very personal mm. to some people. Um, I mean, there are books wrote on it. Um, and I think maybe some people elaborate a little bit on it, of, of this. With, with the nets, you're just talking about this, when you made a new net, I mean, you have made nets here in Scarborough even now, What do you have them blessed, or do, is there any sort of uh, ceremony you go yeah, through? You just, the, look, just yeah, use them? Yeah, the normal hmm. thing is that um, most skippers will say, right, oh, I've put your new net on, uh, it's okay. So obviously it's caught fish. If it had been put on and never caught a thing, then you begin to suspect. Um, I was in a ship called the DB Finn, again out of the hull, um, with one of the top skippers. And uh, just somebody had invented a net with what they call a split wing trawl, of which we had one, um, all in beautiful white nylon. And right, we'll, uh, we'll try this and see how many bags of fish we're gonna get. And it came up as what we would have described, knackered, limbless. So we started to mend it and we mended it and we shot it away again. And again, it didn't work. And again, and again. And in the end he said, right, come on, somebody think of something. And the idea of the split wing trawl is you have a low part, this up and it lets you have the headline higher. The higher the headline, the more chance you get a more fish. But it wasn't working. And you know, it, it, the mate actually was a, a Faroese guy and um, he, he sort of looked at it and maybe measurements are wrong, we measured this, we measured that, we measured the other. And in the end he said, right, I'm going to do what I should have done after the first haul. He said, I had this prickly feeling at the back of my neck, this isn't going to work. So he said, take it off, we'll wrap it up, put it forward and one will go in, but he says, if anybody has any ideas, please, you know, let me know. 
and we, you know, we, we, a couple of us sat and talked. I've always been interested in that. And it's the only thing I noticed was that there was no strong backs around the, the wing section. So we wrote that down and other things. And funny enough now, when you get a split wing troll, that's the first thing you notice. The strong backs, what we call a strong back. Um, net can only take so much strain. And um, that that's the thing. And it, it, it's still much the same. Um, they're inventing new nets to do this, to do that. And when you look at the years that um, the Otter Troll, which we always reckoned it was made and de designed and founded in Scarborough, was so successful for so many years. And I did find out that uh, the thing that the earliest Otter Troll was developed by a minister of religion, which maybe it wouldn't please some people, but again, um, superstitions can always be turned around the other way and that's what I honestly believe in I just think it's a fascinating wonderful subject um, everything doesn't come up like the two-headed penny and that's not a superstition that can be but for some guys to can come along and do things like that I think utterly fascinating excellent thank you I know, I've, I've, I've oh. twigged it like, mm. I usually do what you call a letter, right? Mm. Um, when you come into where children were involved, um, and it was one that was never in our family, but it was in some of the other families um, around Hesle Road, which are very, very close-knit society. Uh, all the little terraces, two up, two down, big families, eight and ten children, and it was considered very, very good luck of a child born at high water and the opposite way around that if the child was born on the ebb tide and I always wondered about that. I could never find out. I, all I knew I was born on a Thursday in a little terrace house at the bottom end of Scarborough Street which when I went and visited when there was nothing there the only thing they built there was the flume tank, which was where they tested troll nets, which I thought to me was a good look omen. And um, so I was within the sort of sound of all the ship's sirens of St Andrew's Dock. And when they say children do understand many things that adults can't fathom, and it, it is true that um, we were evacuated to Scarborough, I was in my mother's arms and she did write, tell me one day, she said, you came in full of pomp and circumstance, but she said you were only knee high to a grasshopper at three years of age to say, I am going to be a fisherman. And of course she said, when you think you were brought up in a house of women, there was my mother, my granny, my sister, two cousins which are girls, um, you were spoiled, pampered and the other and you wanted to pick one of the hardest jobs in the world. And then, of course, when I did go into the family tree thing, and I found out that on my mother's side, oh, seven or eight generations of fishermen in Lowestoft. On my father's side, there were yet generations of fishermen on the south banks of the Humber. Um, so I really was destined to be that way. So it's um, maybe one of them things that a lot of children um, don't realise it, I think it lays lurking and it needs things to bring it out. And the funny thing now, um, I enjoy talking to children and fishing. I mean, I love the life. Um, it was hard, there was times when you said, oh, damn it, bugger it. But it was still there. And if I had to really think and say, right, was there a superstition that came up that ruled me on that, I would say no, I would say more on the religious side, which really we're not going into, but when you think of, of how it was, and it was only last week when we had a party of children down and we were showing them fish, and we showed them a haddock and the fingerprints, and they all looked in quite amazement. And 
to me, that was one of the lovely stories I always cherished about the Bible. You know, the feeding of the multitude. And uh, that's part of it. And the, the other part was they were got not catching fish. And so Jesus had said, right, cast your nets on the right side and you will get an abundance of fish. Um, for something to have been wrote how many thousand years ago, we don't know. But it does come quite true, a lot of it. And when you sail, uh, I have sailed with a few skippers that were quite religious. Uh, not religious enough not to be able to fish on a Sunday, um, which is quite amazing. And uh, at one time, my father he went off to be a fishing master on a Dutch trawler. And he said, that broke my heart. That there it was on good fishing and at Saturday midnight with all the net and we couldn't shoot it away till Sunday midnight. And he said that was hard luck. <laughs> but again, that's the religious side. It's up to people, I think, that can say, right, well, I believe that bit, that's superstition, and that bit's religion. Because they are tied together. I mean, lots of things that people say about, you know, the devil's toys and things. They're superstitions. Um, and, I, and I've always, always been one that when it comes to charities, things like that, giving gifts, giving the other, um, fishermen are among the most abundant people. And to me, that's maybe one of the things I'm proud to be a fisherman. Somebody mentioned about cross knives and forks. Does that, that do anything for you? <laughs> not a not a thing, because when you think about how you eat, what do you do? You stab it with the fork, you cross that way with the knife. So, um, no, no, not that way. Um, I mean, pets. There's, there's somebody mentioned pets to me one day. Well, oh, it's not, you know, it's good luck for this, it's good luck, you know, all that sort of thing. Um... And then, of course, you get, you know, all black cats, white cats, this cat. And I think, uh, let's be honest, um, pets nowadays, maybe, you know, way back when they were an object that you had to use to guard your property or the other, but to bring pets into, as you call it, a pet, it's something that you do. The pet is part of you. And I think it's one of them things that where children should be brought up um, in with pets around them and I think that we've they come from school and they say something oh that's so and so Mrs. M or Miss so and so said we shouldn't do that it should be questioned because somebody else's peculiarities can play on kids minds and that is you know the only thing I you know they're right explain what she said and I'll tell you what I think and that's, I mean, some, some superstitions are frightening. You know, um, I mean, uh, there's times when I used to, you know, go and take my dog for a walk over in the cemetery. I said, aren't you frightening? I said, no, there's nobody in there going to harm us. You know, why, why is there always this, is it a superstition that people are frightened to walk in a cemetery? Um... And, and it's surprising when you when you read on some of the gravestones um, that you can read in some of the superstitions that people believe. So uh, it's it's one of those things. I think nowadays that you know in cremation, um, somebody said, "Well, why cremate?" I said, "Well, if you know the person, it's maybe what they want. They don't want to go into that side of it, you know, and that's it." And post office next door. Uh, it's it's fantastic that people still believe in superstitions. Mm. It's a thing. Do you how do you feel about I mean the sea and the boats because people call boats a she. Do you do you feel they have a spirit as well? And do you feel the sea has a is it a character? Is it a, a like a a good spirit or a bad spirit? Do you feel that they have? you know, human yeah. characteristics? Uh, I'll be, well, me as a person and as being a fisherman and a seaman, I love the sea. I love what it can do. 
frightening at times, but not, I'm not frightened. I know what it can do. So I, I treat it with the greatest of respect. And I did read a little bit in the, uh, one of the things I did the other day, a young lady called Fanny Robinson. And she said, man can love the sea, but he must also respect it because he will never master it. And I think that the sentiment in such a short sentence is there. Um, you know, we, we, we've just done things on the Titanic. Um, and there's a million people who say, well, it was this, it was that, it was the other. But somewhere along the line, somebody has not respected the sea. You, you can't just go willy-nilly here, there, everywhere. Um, and more so nowadays. I mean, we're getting bigger ships, less crew, and I will say a bit tongue-in-cheek, less experienced crew. I mean, I have heard little tales of, um, I do have a relative, actually, that went and bought his master's ticket in Monrovia. Um, that, to me, that, that, it, that's heading for bad luck. If I'm going to be superstitious, and I'll say it that way, that's heading for bad luck. Mm -hmm. If you're going to go out there, go out well prepared. You know, do the right things. Do the things that you're taught. If you've gone to a decent, you know, nautical school, the other things. Do things that you feel are right. Don't do anything daft, because the daft bit will come out very quickly. And that's my great, great belief in the sea. It's there to test you. And test you, it does. Many, many times I've been tested at it. But I'm still here. And I'm just glad that I can talk to other people about it. Mm. And that's not through superstition. It's through just practical yeah. ability and keeping yourself safe. Yeah. But I do think, you know, some of the superstitions come from... Um, oh, well, we, we had a good trip that trip, didn't we? What would do what? You know, oh, so, oh, our whole city won, or something like that. Oh, well, next time the one will have another good trip. It, it comes in from somebody's very, very quick mind. What happened on that trip? We did so-and-so, didn't it? Oh, so-and-so had a green jumper on or a yellow jumper. Or, or, um, it's, you know, silly little things that come in, but they grow. And, uh, yeah, well, that was good weather. We did so-and-so. And it, it's one of them things. And... A lot of skippers, I mean, I have all my father's logbooks and his diaries, and I read through them, and I see some of the superstitions. Oh, we caught so-and-so at this time two years ago. Uh, you know, and we saw so-and-so. Um, there was an iceberg there, and we towed around it, and we got a bag of fish. And to some people, the iceberg will then become a good luck thing. And it poss possibly had nothing to do with it. But again, it's a well-proven fact that fish do go under the ice. So is that a superstition? Or, or There's so, so many things that come in to make a superstition. And the more people that have a go at it and say, well, this, that and the other, the more the superstition becomes real. Yeah, and that's working, right. I think. Are so, we're we going to tell Lindy that we're... Yes, you are. So, uh, if you can just uh, tell me your name and your date of birth. Right. Uh, Tom Rowley, 25147. Right, lovely. Thanks, Tom. Right, the project, as you know, is about uh, superstitions, mm. um, about how superstitions kept people safe at sea, and also how they helped them get a good catch. So, would you just tell us, uh, basically, what superstitions you remember or what um, you've heard about? Uh, well, superstitions mostly come like a lot of them are localised and a lot of them are well, seamen's superstitions, I suppose. When my earliest memories were, uh, the most common ones was PIG and uh, long tails, which is self-definition. Uh, and uh, we were allowed to say them, or bunnies. That was always uh, my dad's... Uh, how we were brought up that I still I still I'm not superstitious as some folks but I still don't like I still say PIG and I still say long tail and that's uh, by and by different skippers had different 
some of them are really really superstitious like uh, I can only speak like local well um, you don't know what you're doing it when you're young you know if you whistled at sea it was you were whistling up a storm uh, if you put the brush you used to sweep the decks if you put the brush on the cod end it meant you're gonna have a clean sweep you're gonna lose all your gear or uh, on the hatches was the same you couldn't put a brush on the hatch so you had like the fish room hatch boards which uh, would maybe consist of four or five boards you know that uh, what dimension at fish room hatch whatever it was when you took the fish room hatch off if you put one of them on upside down you would get a smack around here because that was inviting the ship to capsize or your, your hatches were upside down it meant it was an omen um, things like that I'm going a bit fast no that's fine why why do you think there was the thing about PIGs and bunnies what, what, what is it I've, about them that makes them not good luck I've never uh, I've never heard the reason why and uh, I, I don't know I've never there is there is things what People uh, clear of your own local things. Go away, then. Oh, for goodness <laughs> sake, go away. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know with the uh, where it comes from or uh, different things. You never got told why. You just got told, don't do this, don't do that. Mm. I mean, my dad was... Uh, he was and he wasn't with some things. We didn't like cross knives. Uh, on the table, which I don't know if that's a seaman's omen or a, a, a just a, a natural bad luck thing, I don't know. Mm. Uh, the colour green, my dad hated green. Um, I don't know why, because my boat was green. And he had he had a boat called the Good Samaritan, what he bought was green, and he painted it blue straight away, changed its colour. But uh, green, green uh, has been very lucky for fishermen in Scarborough. I would think the top fishermen in Scarborough at the main prizes and uh, Colin Jenkinson, all their boats were green and uh, they were top dogs, you know. Mm. Do you think once again that the green thing is to do with the land, isn't it? The same as the animals you mentioned, mm. as, uh, to do with the land and not to do with the sea. So is that the difference? When you're at sea, you're in a different world Well, to probably. The land. I, I don't know. You, you read things about uh, green being lucky for the Irish, and then uh, other things with Irish myths was if you wore too much green, you were taking the mickey out of them, and it was unlucky. So if you went over top with green, well, whether that's how to do with it, I, I really don't know. But, but local uh, superstitions were um, like uh, like with the animals was the big biggest thing. I think you couldn't uh, mention them; you would you would really be in trouble. And I mean, did anybody ever take one of these animals on board, or ever mention it no. that a disaster happened? Was there a an no. instance where it was known that something bad happened? No, not not to my knowledge. No, I mean, our generation were uh, strict with it as our parents were, you know, and I, I suppose they were as strict as the parents before them. It was. It's gradually waned out a little bit, but there is things I just curl up and I think, uh, oh, I don't like that word, or uh, it's just it's just still in there. It don't go with it. Uh, so I mean, obviously you have a lot of respect for the sea mm. because it's it's a dangerous place, isn't it? It can mm. it can take lives. Oh, so do oh, you worse, yeah. do you feel that then you kind of do you make any offerings to it, like you know, uh, pouring a bit of whiskey in or throwing a coin in or anything like that? I have thrown like... I've thrown coins in, yeah. Just uh, I've seen people do that, and because uh, at one stage you were you were told not to say, take money to sea with you. And uh, yeah, I've, I've chucked up coin in. I think everybody has at, at some stage. And uh, I've even taken a vicar to see, which was voodoo. He, that wasn't allowed. But we had a vicar lived opposite here. He was uh, as close as I got to the church, and he was like a fisherman's friend because he would come in pub. Uh, he's passed on now. He, he, but he was as close as fisherman got to the church. And his name was Charlie Bubbins, and he come. He wanted to come to see one day. And uh, I took him, and the, the skipper didn't know he was a clergyman, of course, but until we were at sea. And then we used to joke with him, because in them days you'd go to sea for a week at a time. And uh, we went fishing very well, and we used to say to Charlie, come and say a few words, see if we can 
get us a little bit of fishing our nets. And uh, no, I was, uh, did it work? Yeah, I think it did, did on that occasion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to joke with him, but um, it's. I mean, it means a lot to a lot of people's superstitions. You read about them. Uh, with me having an interest in the sea, it's uh, one thing I did read. I, I was reading of interest was like, uh, well, like you've heard of a woman aboard a ship is unlucky, mm -hmm. and uh, that's for obvious reasons. A woman is distracting the men from the work. We're still chauvinists in we respect that. We don't think they can do a man's job, and that goes both ways as well. Because I don't think we could do their jobs. But um, have you ever heard of that? A naked woman was good. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, because the, the naked woman used to shame the storms. Oh. So when you look at figure heads, they're all bare-breasted women. And that, that was why the big ships had a, a big bosomed oh. um, figurehead on the figurehead. But the trawler boats don't have anything like no. that, do they? they no, boats. but the trawler boats were earning, like working for a living. I've never actually seen it done, but I know it has happened plenty of times in Scam. When they were having a bad run of luck, You've heard of the witches, and if a ship's loaded with witches, even the witches knot, if you pull a rope in and it's got a knot in it where it shouldn't be, you know, even if it's an overhand knot in your head rope, it's a witch's knot, it's an omen, it's a bad, bad omen. You, mm. you never leave that rope like that, you take the knot out and different things. And when, when the old skippers were really down and not earning any money, and uh, that happens in fishing a lot, and you wonder what sort of you get when your last resort is to burn the witches. So they used to go around the top rail of the boat with a torch, a lighted torch, and burn the witches off that ship else to get the look back else. And, and uh, yeah, I suppose it probably worked. Mind over matter, if you thought it was going to work, it would, it would probably work. Yeah. Because if if you weren't you catching, feel better. if you weren't catching fish, you were starving. Your family well, was starving. Well, basically. if you weren't catching fish, that was that was everything for you, the crew, and everybody. So, wow, yeah. But I can, I can imagine. I've never seen it done, but I can imagine it being done. I would do it myself if I thought yeah. that was going to. You, you, when you're in, in uh, desperate, when you're out fishing, you've done everything you're capable and your knowledge of doing, and you still can't catch fish for some reason. It, it does it. It's a lot of stress on you. Try anything. Were there? I mean, when you're talking about witches, were there people in the town or Scarborough that you well, kind of felt carried bad luck or were bad? Yeah, there was moment? people who you didn't like to see. You, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you a story about a, an undertaker, what nobody liked to see. We had a, and we've got a lad even on the scene now what they call Norwest Nigel, and every time we see him, he's a postman. He's a postman, nobody likes to see him because you get northwesterly winds. Oh. But Arnie, uh, the undertaker, I've seen, uh, well, we were lowering crab pots in when I first left school with my father, and Arnie, Arnie come from Leeds or somewhere, and we were lowering pots into the boat because he was an undertaker. We got the last pot in, so we maybe had 150 pots in, in the boat. We pulled them all out again and started again because he, he turned up. Wow. <laughs> and I think he, he wasn't, he was, yeah, and women dressed in black and uh, you hear all these tales about black cats and cross-eyed women. Because because where I come from in London, black cats are unlucky, but yeah. here they're lucky. Well, they? yeah, they're supposed to be lucky to uh, go and see, but well, some of them have different views of it. Some of them won't go because they've seen a black cat when they're going down to see and different different things and cross-eyed woman I but how are you going to see a cross-eyed woman when you're going down to see you're going to have to look very close to and uh, different things it's i think it, a lot of it comes down from generation what fathers mm -hmm. passed down mm -hmm. and you get brainwashed with it and you believe it to be true so mm -hmm. or some of them you want to believe in anyhow you think if because uh, it's good omens as well as bad omens with uh I mean, you never kill a seabird. You're never supposed to. Or the albatross, what you heard about. But locally, you, you, you never kill a, a seabird because it's the we're all supposed to come back as uh, seabirds. As seabirds, yeah. yeah right. And that could be a, another reason for the uh, green. What what we were on about earlier, because uh, when fishermen die, they go to Fiddler's Green. Oh, yeah. So Fiddler's Green is is uh, you're supposed to. If you've been a long time seaman, 50 years or so, you, you die, you go to Fiddler's Green, like the Vikings went to Valhalla. Mm. Fishermen all go to Fiddler's Green, so the green was probably bringing it forward a little bit. You don't like to see the green. Mm. 
Yeah, it's interesting. As you say, a lot of these things come down through the generations, do they? Yeah, and they get they get uh, people put their own little bits in them, and they get flung about. So I don't think there's any any real bona fide fact for any of them, really. What do you think? We've heard about the not washing the fisherman's clothes yeah. when he goes to heard sea. That. Is that uh, yeah? Yeah, that well, that you're washing him away if you wash his clothes, yeah. And he's same as uh, sailing on a Friday, was a big voodoo. And that I've always understood that to be because uh, Christ was crucified on a Friday, so you, you just although you're not religious, these little things do. Oh, I'm not religious to that extent, but I, I still like to believe that's that's the case. What why well, that was so. And yeah, you don't wash the, don't wash the clothes on sailing days. And... Also, got just talking about people. I've always got redheads here. Redheads, yeah. <laughs> well, the the thing with the redhead was you, you you could speak to them, but they had to speak to you first. I think it was yeah. that 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 killed the. I think it's one of them like on on a stage if you wish somebody good luck break a leg, good luck or whatever they do. But they've got to say it back to you. I don't know if they've got to say it to you first before. And I think it's something similar with the redhead, yeah. Mm. You break, you can break the curse if if they speak to you first. Okay. And uh, anything about cutting nails or hair at sea? Is that, is that no, I've about? never, uh, I've never heard that one. No, I think that might be from sailors from long yeah, ago when yeah. they were on long voyages, you know, sailing across. Have you have you sailed across the equator? Because I know no. there's special things with that, aren't they? Yeah, I've never done that. I've never. Uh, I've never been anywhere like that. What about fishing up boots? If you catch a boot in the, no, in the no, net. Never heard that one, now. That was a dead man's boot. Yeah. A le apparently a left, leg, a left boot is, uh, is not good and a right boot is OK. Well, that's, that's another... The, the more myths, I think, aren't there? Because they used to say, you don't step aboard a boat with your left foot. You always go on the boat first with your right foot, but... Mm. I, I don't see anybody uh, doing that, you know. No. Do you think with the sort of advent of technology now, satellites and sonar and things, that people trust more in well, the technology now than they do in the superstitions? It's, it's a safer place than it, than it ever was. Like any other industry, the things are uh, getting more advanced and it's all to do with well-being and, and safety, but... You can't you can't change the elements. The sea is a is a ferocious place, and you've never never underestimated it. That's uh, as long as men go to sea in ships, the sea will take them if it wants it. Don't matter all these unsinkable and can't do this, can't do that. Mm. They did it with them trawlers what were lost in the 60s, and they said, oh, they built the gall, and uh, after that, and put those three trawlers sunk in a week, weren't they? Out of all, couldn't do this, couldn't do that. that well, Unless you're out there and you see what conditions are like, you, you know it. It's not like uh, in a floam tank with a scale model where you can knock it over and if it, it's totally different. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, in, on, on the side of boats, I mean, there, there's a few things about the names of boats and having coins built into the hull yeah. or the, under the mast. Yeah, they? I've seen that. And horseshoes, of course, you have a horseshoe, you don't put it up you don't tip it upside down so you tip your look out right. so you see a lot of a lot of, a lot of boats with a horseshoe in front of the wheelhouse mm -hmm. or on the mast something like that yeah well that's that's quite common okay and the name yeah i mean the, the lots of names are associated with good luck and things like that i mean right. you've seen a titanic too have you <laughs> <laughs> Because women, women, I mean, we talk about women not going to sea, and I read something about, you know, that, that ships shouldn't have a woman's name, but in fact a lot of the trawlers well, do, in Scarborough, yeah. the smaller boats, have Ethel or Betty most, or Mary. Most, or most boat, well, most boats are named, well, you always call a ship a she, don't you? Mm. Boat a she, whatever you want to call it, you never call it he. Mm. So, yeah, the, the girls' names are... was an unlucky... I think there are more ships named after women than men, easily. Yeah. yeah. I think probably that's referring to like the navy back back in the old days when everything was called Endeavour and yeah. Challenge and Invincible, yeah. you know. It yeah. was very uh strong names. Strong names, yeah. Um, anything about bells or to do with the way you pull the nets in either side of a ship 
Mm. Does yeah. it matter which side you pull the net to? Well, yeah, most, it depends how they're rigged. I mean, most sports you can only pull them in one side if, if, if unless it's uh, rigged to do well. Other, otherwise, you know. But no, there's no. I've never heard any strict uh, and bells. No. Okay. You know, different things you don't. Uh, some things you don't like changing on the boat. You know. I mean, people say like with the boat's name, you've just been on the boat. A lot of people. Uh, still stick by that they would never change a boat's name so mm. but that's again up to the individual I've never known any bad luck come from it mm. anybody changing you, you've probably seen somebody not doing as well and you've said oh well I've changed name and mm. or I've, I've never been that 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 strong into superstitions mm. I think it's it's drained out a little bit mm. It's just, it's just the the big thing is you'll find fishing families um, all over. Just the animals, I think that is the top of the list with most fishermen who come who come in with a PIG. Mm. And, and are, are there any lucky animals like dolphins or anything? Well, like dolphins that? they always say lucky, don't they? If you see dolphins, but that, that, where it comes from, I don't know. They always say uh, uh, the dolphin, the Lord's with you, and you've got. It comes back to religion a lot of it. And it, it's what you want to believe, because it's the same the other way. If you've got um, sharks following you, they say that's sign of death and, and different things, you know. But, but black, I mean, uh, black is uh, is black is uh, a sign of death on shore as as well as at sea. So mm. people didn't like black, but. Mm. So were there things, did you have little habits when you were thinking about going to sea? I mean, you were a trawler man for many years. No, I never, were there any habits you had? No, I never like, put know, one sock on first or, or anything like that. No. Did you have a St Christopher or anything like that? I had a that? St Christopher, yeah, but I don't, I don't wear anything. I, I've never worn rings. It's, it's, you don't wear... Um, most people who go to sea don't wear jewellery of any sort. And I, I still don't like out around my wrists or my neck. I've... I've got loads of watches, but I never wear a watch. Even even when I'm dressed, I don't wear a watch. And um, and I've loads of rings, and I don't wear them because they, anything can catch. Mm. Uh, I mean, you wouldn't have your watch on fishing anyhow, but a ring could catch in even in a mash of a net, and it'll pull you. I've seen people pull down deck with them and things like that with rings and different mm. things. So they're they're dangerous. So it's just common sense if you. So do you think, I mean, if, if you were talking about this unlucky postman guy, yeah. do you think they were just clumsy people, basically? They weren't unlucky, well, they were just clumsy. Well, I don't know, I believe in that. I right. believe he is unlucky, because uh, he, 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 nine times out of ten, people take notice, and it, uh, on, in that individual case, it is no West Wind. So, yeah, yeah I, I, would, I would tend to go along with that one. I mean, I, I, everybody would call him no West Nigel still. We don't like it. <laughs> so you're still a postman then? You're still a postman, yeah. <laughs> it's all right, it takes it in good stead. There's oh, quite a bit of truth in it. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a thing about tattoos, but um, no, well, I don't know about tattoos. Tattoos, I think that's... Uh, well, gold earrings was another one, wasn't it? With, with semen in general, I think tattoos when they come on. Um, myself and I've got a mate, we've got pretty much the same tattoos, we got them on when we were young, got my name on both arms, that was a thing, well, if you lost an arm or you were lost or anything. Uh, what, well, you'd find your arm with well, the name yeah, on? Well, you didn't, think, you didn't think about it as that, but that, that was the back of your mind when you... And then uh, gold earrings were a myth about you had enough gold on you to bury you if you were lost at sea. That's why seamen wore a gold earring, but everybody wears them now. Yeah. Except seamen, I've never had one. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't have jewellery at all. Well, as you say, it's a danger if it catches in yeah. something, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. Anything what catches, especially rings. I've seen men uh, nearly over the side with a ring, you know, catching in net. Um, got something about putting bread down upside down. Would that be the same as the hatches, the sea hatches? Yeah, I've heard that, but I've never, I've, I've never, never seen a lot of these yeah. uh, or people take any notice of that. Yeah. Uh, uh, cross knives. A lot of people don't like cross knives on the table. Mm. 
and in in the galley I've seen old lads who oh, get that off the table you know dip. I mean that that put arms at home as well so whether it's something what's come from shore or vice versa mm. I don't know but people carry it on and mm. most of it I think is what your parents bring you up with if, mm. you, if you if you're brought up with strict sidelines as far as superstitions go I think you believe what your dad tells you mm. it carries on and we were looking yesterday at the museum at a call, a baby's call. Oh, yeah. Apparently, is, well, apparently my father was born with, with one on. Oh. Never actually saw it, but my grand's supposed to have had it. And uh, that that was, uh, well, it, it, the, the story behind that is you'll never drown if you were born with a cowl over your face. And, well, I wouldn't know. I mean, you like to believe in some of these things. If uh, most most fishermen and most seamen, I, I, what I know, I can't swim even. So, and and they say that they would never bother learning it. Just prolongs death. Right. If you were going to go, you'd go. And sometimes it's quicker to go than trying to hang on. You know, if you know you're not going to get anywhere. A lot of people I've worked with can't can't walk even learn to swim. Because there was that woman that fell off the back of a ferry last week. And oh, she, she was lucky, wasn't she? She, yeah. she swam for half an hour and she yeah. was rescued. Just pick yeah. her up even in dark yeah. and turn around. It was brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. yeah the, the cow thing is interesting, isn't it? Because mm. it was it was in a little box and yeah. it looks, it's just part of the It's supposed to be good it? luck and, mm. and uh, bring good luck for the rest of your life and that, yeah. And they, and they changed hands for hundreds of pounds. They were worth That's a right, and sold them on, didn't they? But yeah. I don't know what happened. If my dad was born with one, I, I never saw it. Oh. But apparently he was, and my gran had it, but whatever happened, I don't know. Well, we were saying that but you'd, be, you'd certainly be a lucky baby because you could sell yeah. it first. Well, my dad didn't have much luck. Oh, really? Oh, so did it not work for him then? Well, he was not a, not a very healthy man, no, in his latter years. He had struggled a lot. But, I mean, that's fairly normal, isn't it, as people get older anyway, or... Yeah, well, in well, my dad's case, I mean, he worked hard all his life, he's wet through all his life, he worked in open cobbles most of his life, you know, he wasn't... Uh, he didn't have the, the cobble men don't have the comfort what trawlers had, of being in both, and if you get hit by a sea in a cobble, you're wet, you're wet for a day, you know, where at trawlers you could go and change your clothes and put... Put a dry rig on, different again. But and he struggled with arthritis and his legs, and he was life man for thirty years. Mm. So he'd, he'd seen a lot of action during the war, and he'd had he'd had a hard life, you know, in general. So. Mm. And he survived it all. Which he is survived it all. So. Yeah, he was uh, relatively. He was seventy four when he died, but uh, it's, it's still he suffered for the last mm. uh, 10, 15 years. He, he he wasn't very healthy at all. Mm. Wow. Do you know anything about salt? Uh, uh, what, throwing it over your shoulder and that? Or putting it on the nets, yeah. I think they get enough salt, don't you? <laughs> oh, no, I don't know anything yeah, about salt. Yeah, I read somewhere that they, some fishermen rub salt on the nets yeah. to encourage, you know, it's a good thing, like throwing it over your shoulder, putting it on the nets was seen as lucky. No, it's, uh, well, it's the same with, uh, no. No, I don't know. Nothing here, no. Uh, I mean that's all I've got on my list here um, unless there's any other sort of things that spring to mind with uh, lucky people or unlucky people or No I think uh, a lot goes uh, going back to like main Price family with uh, with their boats all coloured green and, and they always had a seven in the registration that you know every one of them right from cobbles right through 50, 60 years of fishing, they've always had a seven in their, in their boat's numbers. Is that a lucky number then? That must be their lucky number, yeah. I mean, mm. they're, they're quite a, a successful fishing family and respected. And, mm. and they had green all over. But my dad, my dad wouldn't have green. He wouldn't have green furniture, nothing green in house. Mm. He just didn't like it. And yet my boat was green because it, it was one of, uh, what do you want to call him, Dilt's boats and uh, lefty green kept the same name and everything yeah. and it, it did me well wow. well that's great well thank you very much for uh, You're welcome contribution good luck <laughs>